So the recording has started. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot that it does that. It does it every time. It's very, it's very consent. It's, it's trained well. To start the recording. Thank you all for being here. Okay. Recording has started. Okay. The recording has been started. Okay. Recording has started. Okay. Recording started. So don't say anything stupid from now on. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the recording has started. Um, I assume that you have had a chance to look over the questions. Ha- I I did. I looked at them a ways a, a, a bit ago, though, when you first sent them. Uh, when you first sent them, and um, that that first batch looked particularly pertinent. Um. Have you ever broken a rule to benefit your patient? I feel like there's very few rules in hard rules in medicine. It's usually a risk benefit discussion that we have. Um, And as such, sometimes we're going to, you know, do something that breaks guidelines or or, or is, is not in line with the guidelines. If we think that the benefits are going to outweigh the, outweigh the, outweigh the risks. Um, there are like institutional policies, which are a little different. Um, and those are generally things you don't cross. Um, and off the top of my head, I'm having a hard time um, thinking one, like I said, it's been a long day. Um, but when it comes to institutional policies, usually if you're going to go against those, there are committees involved that you can like, you can take whatever your specific issue is um, and they can kind of, review it in a, in a panel and decide whether or not you meet, you know, a special exception or something like that. But in terms of like the practice of medicine specifically, it's almost always a risk benefit discussion and not hard rules and policies. How hard is it to separate your ethical views from your physician duties? Do you take classes or training courses to help you separate your moral perspective from your job? The, to answer the second part, I don't think I took any classes as far as how to morally separate. We certainly in med school had a very good um, exposure as far as to um, all types of, of persons. And there was a strong emphasis on being able to um, uh, being able to recognize the humanity in each person and, and, and differences and recognizing that's OK. You know, when I went to med school, that was. 2012 2016 which was 10 years ago and the world's completely different i remember we had a a whole panel uh in our sexual health class where it was just um they wanted to show us as much diversity as they could and and, you know i went to school in oklahoma so um the lgbt community certainly i mean um was there in oklahoma city um i went to a couple drag shows and that was fun but it wasn't front and center everywhere you go in oklahoma city i mean it's full of full of cowboys and, and other such, but in the middle of the med school, we had um, um, a transgender woman, um, you know, a more cis, a gay man, um, an asexual woman. Uh, and so it, was, it, it, it really just, um, it was interesting as far as addressing how they've been approached in the healthcare field. And that was more the, the focus of it, uh, as far as the, the engagement with our class was more how people of different um, sexual, sexual and gender orientations uh, are approached in medicine. But at the same time, uh, I think it kind of goes into as well as far as morals um, and as far as, as recognizing um, the importance of each individual. Um, not saying that there was any sort of sentiment of, okay, this is different than us, but it's it, it was just let's make sure everyone has um exposure to diversity that you might not get from the average patient that's coming in uh, to the clinic. Um, But at the same time, so to answer the question as far as uh, the first part, uh, separating your morals, um, I don't think I really have had to. I'm more kind of laissez-faire or sort of, um, 
I guess you the the play would be ignatiously indifferent. You know, let people kind of let what happens happens, and and we'll see. Uh, but let people kind of make their own decisions, and you can't really be judgmental with people in healthcare. You're just going to get frustrated and and, and waste energy. Um, uh, but in general, you you have to just let people um, give them the information, try and help them make the, the best decision they make their own. And I think at the same time, one of the things about not about your morality and, and other people or, or your perspective is making sure that you're not um, unduly influencing people or sort of being too persuasive. It's very often that patients and people will come in and just say, oh, you're the doctor, make the decision or, you know, how you sell it is, is kind of, um, uh, how they'll go about it and you got to be careful that you know you might be excited or say oh this is the best idea but but realistically it's it, it's not as black and white it's not everybody you know you get 10 other physicians and um, all 10 are going to recommend the same thing so you got to make sure that you're not um, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the word but you got to make sure that you're you're letting the person that's in front of you actually make the decision and not just echo what you are telling them and even if you would say, okay, I would go with A, I'd go with this procedure, B is okay as well. Um, you you got to make sure that you're not kind of selling them um, your idea or what you think is right, but really giving more of an objective, which can be tough, um, especially if, you know, your livelihood or depends on what you do and you know that you have more control. People are always um, more likely to offer something if it's kind of in their control or in their wheelhouse. And that might not be the best thing. Um, you know, it's, it's not wrong, you know, for what I do on a daily basis, there's, um, similar ways, but different than interventional radiology or surgery can do very similar things. And sometimes you have to take a step, uh, a step back and, you know, swallow your pride and say, you know what, I can do this. Um, it is an option, but probably if this person did it, that she or he would be able to do it in a safer manner and probably a more long lasting solution. What is your specialty and why did you choose it? Very complicated uh, answer. Um, someone told me that I would be very good in gastroenterology and it was a, he was a mentor and I trusted him. I feel that my instincts fit well. Um, we talked earlier about empathy, and I do have a relatively strong empathy, uh, I guess, empathic instinct, the reflex. Uh, I, 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 can, I can get into people's kind of emotional space pretty effectively, so, that, so it fits. I am doing interventional or advanced endoscopy. Um, I get to have um, on the best of both worlds, training in internal medicine, where I get to think about things every day. But at the same time, I do frequent uh, procedures and therapeutic interventions similar to surgery. Good question. Um, radiology, chose it for a lot of reasons. Um, I find it incredibly interesting. Um, and honestly, you don't say this in the interview process, there's a great work-life balance relative to a lot of other specialties bariatric surgery um and i when i was doing my rotations the very first one i had um in pa school was a surgical rotation with plastic surgery and i loved surgery but i also really like um the aspect of my in in particular i get to be in the or and do that to me that kind of stuff but i also get like the lifespan of a patient, right? Because they see us before surgery, we do surgery, and then I get to follow up with them after surgery. And I like that continuity of it. And, you know, getting to help people that way is really awesome. <laughs> uh, critical care, because I like the elegance of the intensive care unit. I don't have to know exactly what's wrong with somebody to know that their airway breathing or circulation is messed up and I have things I can do about it surgery and because everything else is boring um surgery is the best thing in the whole entire world and we're the coolest specialty is it acceptable to like cover up or avoid mistakes that don't cause any harm to the patient something that happened recently um in uh during uh one of our procedures uh, something uh you know went wrong and it was fixed right away. 
Um, but you know, something that shouldn't have happened. And, uh, the surgeon that I work with talked to the patient, you know, and, um, and said, this is what happened. It's not going to change your outcome, but they need you to know this because it was something that went wrong that shouldn't have happened. And this is why it happened. And this is how we're going to fix it for, you know, the next patient, um, so that that doesn't happen. And, um, I think that, you know, at first the patient was very understandably very upset that, you know, something went wrong with their surgery and worried about it. And I think kind of, um, had a little bit of time to sort of perseverate on it, maybe a little bit understandably. And when, um, she came back like a week after her surgery, we always see patients for post-op follow-up. And I saw her and, and she had a lot of questions about it and was very anxious about it, you know, whether or not it's going to change things. And so I think, you know, when she was first told, I think, you know, she, it was just after surgery, she was probably on some pain medication, waking up from anesthesia. Like I think did, you know, but then I brought the surgeon in with me and we both talked to her about it. And I think she was just really grateful that we had told her. And, you know, we reassured her that, you know, it, did, it, you know, wasn't going to change the course of anything. It wasn't, you know, didn't leave her at a higher risk for anything. And so, I, but I, you know, I really believe that if you, if everyone's human, everyone makes mistakes. And if you own up to a mistake, even though it didn't, you know, cause anything, it makes patients feel better about you know, being your patient and about the provider that you are. But for the most part, to own up to your mistake and explain it to the people involved, um, generally, and I'm not saying 100%, but generally, you gain their respect. Um, and that actually really happened to me as a patient. Um my oncologist when I had breast cancer looked at my records and said she knew exactly what treatment I needed, which involved chemotherapy. And, uh, and I sort of whined about it. I'm like, that's like poison. I don't, I don't really want to have poison. And I, if I can avoid it, I'm not going to be stupid, but if I can avoid it. So she kind of said, well, there's one new sort of test and um, it's so new that I don't, I'm not confident in it yet, but it's available if you'd like me to send your uh, tumor off to have a, what they call an oncotype reading. So in the meantime, she talked to people where she trained, UCLA, uh, Washington in the state of Washington, University of Washington. And then my test, which scored from one to 100, came back a 12, which was low, which is good. And so we had a meeting to discuss the results of my, my cell test. And she felt, she said, you know what? I've done research, I've talked to people um, I changed my mind. Uh, this oncotype is important and really what they're discovering now. And the thing with almost any medical thing is it changes by the minute almost, right? And so what they're discovering now is that in your situation with your cell type, da, 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 that chemotherapy doesn't even help. Mm -hmm. Because I was prepared to say, you know what, if if it just eliminates a possibility, I'll go ahead with it. And she's telling me, no, it doesn't, it doesn't do squat for you. So I've she says, I've changed my mind and I don't recommend chemotherapy. And she felt terrible about it. She said, I'm so sorry I put you through all that. I said, Are you kidding me? That's great news. <laughs> And to think that you went through the trouble of getting that new information, she's a very busy person, and um, 
and then were willing to change your mind. I mean, to me, that was like huge. So she, by explaining all that to me, she got my respect. And I think in, in, a, in a perfect world, that's what happens. What is your favorite way to de-stress after a long day of work? So the reason I like this question is because it was actually one of the, my favorite questions that I've ever gotten during like interviewing people who are going to be residents. Um, And the question was phrased a little bit differently, but sort of like, how do you cope with the stress of being a resident? Um, which is a lot different than the stress of being a student um, because you take on a lot more responsibility than you previously had. And all of a sudden you're the person putting in orders. You're the person, in my case, as a surgeon operating on someone. So you're actually physically, you know, cutting people open. Um, It's a lot more responsibility um, and a lot more opportunity to actively cause harm to people. Mm. Um, or to passively cause harm to people where you like miss something um, and it was something important. uh, And then the patient kind of like, you know, suffers because of that. Um, And it could be in like a really minor way, you know, an extra day in the hospital or something like that. Um, But those are things that you don't want to miss. So what I did as an intern to deal with the stress of like starting residency is when I would come home from work, I would think about the day and I would kind of think about sort of the five major things that I think that I had missed or messed up or could have probably done better that were the most important. Um, I limited it to five things because you can go on forever, Um, especially when you're just starting out. Like we're all human, we all make mistakes. Um, and then I would sit down with my journal and I would think about those five things and I would write down the way that I was going to not make the same mistake again. Um, so it was like taking the negative and making it a constructive, actionable thing for me to do better. Um, and that really helped to decrease sort of the, feeling of not knowing what to do um, and uh, the guilt that I would feel for missing things um, and like the, you know, self um, back talk that you give yourself whenever you, you know, we're a lot of us are type A and sort of anal retentive people. Um, so we, you know, fixate on things when we do them wrong. And um, that helps to be more active and figuring out a way to do better um, and make it like more of a positive instead of a negative. Anything else you do to help you de-stress? Any other more um, casual thing? Is it like talk with friends or is it go for hikes or is there any like play volleyball Um, on the weekends or what do you, what do you do? (laughs) So So the journaling thing I really only did for like the first like month or two of residency. And then I like, it's almost like your body just adjusts to the new level of stress and is like, oh, this is my new baseline. Um, And you kind of just adjust to it. Um, What I do now when I have a really, really bad day at work um, is I take a really long shower, uh, talk to my mom buy myself some comfort food and then probably talk to, uh, I have like one co-resident that I'm really, really close with. Um, so if I have a bad day, uh, I'll either ask him to come over or I'll call him on the phone. With all the advancements in CRISPR, they're able to do what's known as a xenotransplantation. Supposing you need one and xenotransplantations have been deemed safe by the FDA, would you rather receive a genetically modified pig kidney or wait a few weeks, maybe months on dialysis, waiting for a live organ donor match. By xenotransplantation, you mean like uh, adjust, uh, genetically adjusting an, an animal uh, organ. Oh yeah, heck yeah. Yeah, in a second, yeah. Oh, uh, kidney? I'll take the pigs. Whatever, kidney, you don't need a kidney. <laughs> if you need a kidney, like you are in dire need of one, what would you do? 
Oh, that, I mean, if, if it works, I mean, I, actually, I mean, the biggest thing you're, you're scared about primarily is not if it's functioning, it's if it's going to send an infection. Um, so that was the biggest things. They, there's been a couple different ones. I don't think it's been kidding. One person did a heart and then, you know, they did a, a couple other ones, but um, there's an interesting podcast I was listening to about it. But yeah, I mean, if they've got, if it gets FDA approval and you're not concerned about infections and it's functional, I mean, I don't care. I mean, we people will walk around with pig heart valves. I'm, they do fine. So it's hard to get a kidney these days. Um, I think, I, I mean, I, you know, listen, I took, all of the COVID shots. <laughs> the first time I could get them, I was like, yep, give them all to me. Um, so I think that I'm pretty trusting in science. And if the FDA and then like they've done, uh, you know, all the testing and whatever, I would probably take it. I mean, if it's been tested, I'd be willing. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be the first. I don't think many of us would. No, I would prefer a live donor or, or a, a, someone on life support. Live organ donor match. Uh, but yeah, pig kidney is fine. Yeah. I would wait. Uh, genetically modified pig kidney, assuming it was cleared by the FDA. I'll go with the pig. Pig. What I want to say, I mean, I think CRISPR, the potential for CRISPR incredible i mean oh my gosh in terms of um you know genetic diseases deformities things that can be just snipped and replaced a little part and all of a sudden i mean if you have a child with a disease like that or even an adult with let's say als or multiple sclerosis I mean, it's almost breathtaking to imagine that we can do that, that we have the potential to do that. And, and um, so I think, I think we need to continue to develop it. The other thing, which is always a problem, is, you know, inevitably people figure out a way to abuse it, right? And they ruin it for everybody because all of a sudden they want to, you know, create Frankensteins or something. And we don't need a Frankenstein, but if they can make money by doing it, they're they're going to figure out how to do it, right? So, so that's distressing, unfortunately, and that will come with the territory. But I think the the potential is just very exciting. People's genetics, right, with it, or you know, certain se parts of their DNA sequence, is that what are you doing that's going to be passed on to their offspring that then, you know, may encounter other problems that you can't even see right now. So it's super cool, right? Great for things that we don't have really great treatment or cures for right now but also could be really, really dangerous. So I think it, you know, it's one of those, like, they're going to need a lot of bioethicists to figure it out. <laughs> uh, what impact do you think advancements in artificial intelligence will have on your field of medicine in the next 10 years? I think, like I was saying earlier, radiology kind of has this stigma that we're going to be replaced first. Cause I think, I think where it comes from is that we spend the most time in front of a computer of probably any other physician. Um, my entire day is essentially in front of a computer. Occasionally I'll go, you know, do something with a patient or very rarely do a procedure. Some radiologists do a lot of procedures, but I do not. Um, that being said, um, after working with a lot of AI and early integrations of it, I think it's a long ways um, from replacing us. Um, there's a lot of problems. It's not, doesn't integrate multiple findings very well. Um, it's not coming up. And who knows? I mean, obviously it's exponential. Who knows where to be in a few years? I think it's going to be more of like a figuring out how to make it work best for us. Like, for example, I've seen a lot of AI research that is focused a lot on detecting whether a nodule is benign or malignant or things like that. Like things, it's fo it seems to like really be focused on, on that um, currently, which is great, but a giant malignant nodule, I'm not likely to miss. Uh, um, what would be, what I think we're going to start seeing more is some integration of like, how did our work faster 
So we're already starting to see this in some ways, like it is scanning for certain critical things like, like blood in the blood in the brain or around the brain, um, uh, pulmonary emboli. I think a lot of people know what those are. Um, and if it detects that or thinks there's a good chance of that being, it will pop it to the top of my list. Um, well, currently actually I will only get an alert, but soon it will be popping to the top of my list. Um, I think it's going to start like auto numbering things, like auto numbering ribs. So ribs are kind of obliqued. So when you're scrolling through, it's really hard to keep track without counting the whole sequence as you kind of scroll through, um, which sounds really silly, but there's a lot of tedious things. I think we're going to start seeing auto auto numbering of those things. Um, it's going to be circling nodules for us to decide whether benign or malignant um, and, or maybe give us its probability. And then we can kind of determine like whether we think it's right or wrong. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more like functional interface to assist um, not just radiologists, but I think we're going to see that all throughout medicine pretty soon. Um, kind of cross-check you. Make sure you didn't miss anything. Like, did you think about this, right? And then you you decide whether or not that is something that you think is legitimate or not legitimate, right? Um, and I think you're going to see that in clinical medicine, um, you know, in the ER, decision support. We read your note that you wrote. Did you consider this? That kind of thing. Um, but I, I think it's a long way from replacing. I do think it's going to drastically change the workflow. And I do think it's going to be for the better. But there's, as we, as we discussed earlier, there's a lot of problems with implicit bias and things in that. And we're going to, I think, for a long time, have to cross-check um, and kind of confirm whatever findings are coming out of this black box that we were talking about. Have you encountered times where you've been forced to go against your morals as a healthcare provider because of the system that you work for? Side note, I'm an aspiring doctor. However, I'm really not a fan of the U.S. healthcare system. I'm afraid of having to face something like this while on the job. So I think this question is much more relevant um, in the current climate surrounding the abortion issues. Um, but outside of that, so I don't face that very often because I'm a surgeon and I know that it's really affecting more of our OBGYN colleagues. Um, and they're having issues with that, but what will, I will say is that basically the way that the U S healthcare system is set up is that you kind of have to outsmart or battle the insurance companies for things that you want for your patient. And it is very, 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 very frustrating. Um, for example, <clears throat> we had a patient who we saw in the office and they came in and we thought they might have a groin hernia, um, but we wanted to get a CAT scan just to see one, what structures were there and two, if it is a hernia or maybe it's like a lymph node or something else. Um, Cause you can have a lot of things in the groin that are not a hernia. Um, and the insurance company denied the CAT scan. And so we have to go through a process called a peer-to-peer -peer where you speak doctor to some doctor that the insurance company has hired. And you have to justify why you want the imaging that you want or the antibiotics or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And like, thankfully for this patient, I had an easy justification and I was able to be like, you know, this is why the alternative imaging you're offering me, they wanted me to get an ultrasound. I was like, this is not the same. It's not equivalent. The, you know, it's not going to give us the correct information. Um, and I was able to make that justification and it was fine. Um, but I've also had this issue where they're denying antibiotics for a patient. Um, when you were sending people home on IV antibiotics, it's because they've had some infection that's resistant to all of the oral antibiotics. There's no option for them to take antibiotics by mouth because the bug doesn't respond to those. Um, and I've had times where I've had to really argue with the insurance company about the antibiotics that I'm sending my patient home on. And they're trying to tell me that I can't do it or that I should choose a different antibiotic. And I'm like, no, because it's resistant to that antibiotic. I can't because it won't work. <laughs> And, you know, it's very frustrating, um, but 
you learn how to work within the confines of the system. And as far as like the insurance stuff, you sort of figure it out. Um, I'm not saying that we do this, but we might do this where we send people to the emergency room for significant pain. And that allows us to take them to the operating room because when people come in through the ER, you have to see them through their whole treatment course, even if they don't have insurance and they can get emergency Medicaid and the, it can get covered. I'm not saying that we do that sometimes, but we might, if it were something that you could do, you know? Um, so those kinds of things, um, you find your work around, um, the abortion climate right now is really a very nuanced discussion and is like a state by state discussion. And I think that that has really put a strain on a lot of healthcare providers, um, especially sort of the high risk pregnancy providers um, who are sort of dealing with these issues regularly. Um, and also, um, some of the pediatric surgeons who see a lot of these, like, um, they'll see them prenatally. So in utero, they'll see patients, you know, the mother while she's pregnant and talk about the fetal abnormalities or whatever was seen on ultrasound. Um, or sometimes we get MRI, um, and it's changing the discussion a little bit that you have. Um, so those kinds of things are, I think, more maybe of what this question is getting at. And unfortunately, it's you got to figure out a way to work within the confines of the system. So if you have a patient that needs what they need, you got to figure out the state you can send them to so that they can get the care that they need. Um, and that's, that's just what it is, unfortunately. And it's tragic. What is your favorite medical related word? My favorite drug name is Ambien. So it helps you fall asleep because you have a good morning. So Ambien. <laughs> um, well, I was a gastroenterologist, so I guess that's it. Tachyphylaxis. Uh, Borgamy. It's either that or, um, oh, uh, gubernaculum. That's another good one. I think it's a renal last year. I'm like the only person I know, but I somehow it sounds like some dirty thing. Dysdietocokinesia. Tantalitis. Cure. Thrombosis. Prognosis. Decubitus. My favorite medical word is ECMO. So the question was, did medical school um, change your morals? Did your morals change after you started practicing medicine? Um, and I think this is, an, this is kind of a complex question in that I don't think my morals themselves changed, but how they interact with the ethical standards of practice uh, might have. And I guess what I mean by that is that um, after going through, through schooling and then in in practice, you really learn a lot about the rigors of how to apply uh, protocols and scientific uh, studies and, and these kinds of things and how you don't necessarily act on, um, I guess, so for example, I have certain morals, I have certain moral standards about how I see, you know, people suffering and people's emotions and how I want to address that. Um, but sometimes there are ethical standards that don't necessarily, not not what to say, but ethically I have to apply the scientific method. I have, you know, I have to make sure that uh, that this is the protocol, and and just because someone is suffering through it, um, doesn't you know? And morally, I want to ease that suffering. Um, sometimes I have to not act on that and that and that makes it uh that makes it interesting and difficult um 
I was saying also that a lot of times in, in my field in psychiatry, I do have to act on my moral instincts and just my, my own personal instincts a lot, but I do have to constantly keep that in check and constantly be aware that I'm not doing something that ultimately might be detrimental in the long run. Did medical school change your morals? Did your morals after you started practice or practicing medicine change? As a young person, before I was even an undergrad, you know, I grew up in a very working class neighborhood. You know, my father's a firefighter. My mother's a school teacher. My neighborhood was full of firefighters and police officers and tradesmen and people who worked very hard. Um, so sort of the ethics of my upbringing in my community that I grew up in was very much work hard and you will be successful. And if you're not successful, the flip side of that, the implicit part of that statement is if you're not successful, it's because you did not work hard enough. And I think that's how what my worldview was as I was a young person in my high school and my college education did a good job to sort of undo that. But it's it's very difficult when you're, you know, this doesn't make excuses for a inaccurate worldview, but it's hard when you're surrounded by people telling you one thing in your formative years and you're not exposed to other views of the world. This is kind of what you lock into. Um, and if I went uh, down the career path that a lot of people that I grew up with did and worked, you know, in, in some of these uh uh, sort of blue collar trade driven civil servant driven professions I probably feel the same way I make a comfortable living and I have a pension because I work very hard and they all do work very hard and do sometimes very dangerous work um, but it's hard not to then pass value judgments and morality judgments on people that didn't go through that path and I think there is I might even go as far as to say an arrogance um, and it's no cut to people to work in any of those professions um, because they see other people who don't work those jobs um, in their mind, not working is hard. So therefore, either in, not deserving of the success that they have, or that's the reason why they're not successful. That was probably how I looked at the world when I was a young person. Going to medical school, definitely, even more so than college, opened me up to a variety of different <clears throat> socioeconomic, cultural, you know, religious, ethnic. Uh, medical school is a pretty diverse place. You know, it's probably not as diverse as it needs to be, but it's definitely better than it was 50 years ago. So that definitely in learning how to care for the sick and starting to go through clinical rotations, um, working with people from a bunch of different backgrounds, it really changed changed how I looked at the world. Um, I, I did my clinical rotations in Chicago in two critical access hospitals. So they're mostly Medicaid funded. Most people don't have private insurance. A lot of people were undocumented. A lot of people were unemployed. Um, and I got to know those patients because I was seeing them every day. So I got to learn about their life. And as a medical student, you probably have the most time out of anybody in the hospital to talk to the patient. So I got to hear what their life stories were like and start to put a sort of, you know, uh, put a face, I guess, to people that fall in these like socioeconomic strata and learn about their struggles. They're very real struggles, the challenges they face, people who really want a good life for themselves and for their family. Um, but for one reason or another, lots of complicated, you know, social, cultural issues weren't able to achieve that. And it sounds, it's a very privileged statement to make, but it, uh, it, it definitely makes you introspective about your own privilege and your own life and sort of, you know, hearing stories directly from the mouth of somebody who lived them um, changed my worldview. I'd like to think for the better. Again, that's, that's a bit of a, a privileged statement to make, but I definitely learned from these people that I was taking care of and these patients that I was taking care of um, about their lives. And I learned that this like kind of cookie cutter view of the world, like I, ex I was finally experiencing human suffering and I was not experiencing human suffering in my upbringing. I only heard about human suffering and working in medicine and medicine and human suffering go hand in hand. So when you experience human suffering and personify that to individuals, you start to try to understand the, their lived experience um, and it changes how you think about the world and how the world works. Um, and then that really accelerated in residency. So um, because now I'm, I have some skin in the game. I'm the physician. I'm not a passive observer. I'm not, you know, a medical student sort of taking notes and then talking about it. It's now as much as it is the patient's problem. It's now my shared problem to try to get them the help that they need to try to get people the rehab they need in order to go back to work, to feed themselves, you know, to get people the medications they need that they can't afford because of how convoluted our healthcare system is in the United States. You know, and now I'm taking care of people who are in tears. They want to control their diabetes, but they can't afford the medication to do it. And they don't know what to do. And I don't know what to do. I can only do so much. I try to connect them with resources. And now I am sharing in a small portion of their helplessness because I'm helpless as a provider. 
based on either the medical system or how our country works or how poverty works in this country, et cetera. Um, you know, and these are people that I care deeply about. They're my patients. I, as a brief aside, you know, I'm taking care of a patient currently who has cancer, but has a terrible insurance plan through his employer. So all the things that I want for him to try to treat his cancer to the best of my ability are limited by what his like health payer situation is. He needs chemotherapy. He can't afford this out of pocket. <clears throat> so I've spent many hours on the phone, very angry with the gatekeepers involved, both with his insurance plan, with the health networks I'm trying to deal with. Because at the end of the day, I'm his primary care doctor. When he comes into my clinic, I just want to treat his cancer, but I can't because I'm not an oncologist. And to, to get him to an oncologist is taken many weeks. And, uh, and it's frustrating because I share in his struggles. And I answer to him when he's like, Doc, how come this isn't happening happening any faster? I have to be the one to explain to him how this all works and why to the healthcare system, he's seemingly less deserving of care than somebody who has more money. Um, so it's it's shitty. It's not a good situation to be in. And again, it's not like a woe is me. This is the path that I chose as a career. But once you have to have these very real discussions with very real people who you care about deeply as your patients, you can't be blinded to the rest of the world anymore. So I think medical school and taking care of patients and the privilege to be a physician and take care of patients has tremendously and dramatically changed my worldview such that if somebody knew me at 16 or 17 and knew what I thought about certain issues or current events and then knew me now, it would, it would be like a completely different me, which I think is a good thing. My wife agrees that it's a good thing. I think she's very happy that I had this, you know, the, the sort of shift in how, how I thought of things. Um, but it's, it's, it's really difficult um, than to try to explain it to people who don't understand because they haven't experienced human suffering um, so close to an individual. How should medical professionals address the opioid epi epidemic? Do you feel guilt with decisions about regarding pain medications? Um, and so I, every week, because we do surgeries all, you know, every week, I am prescribing some, um, opioids for patients, um, loxycodone in particular, um, for acute post-surgical pain. And I think it's really, they're really great for that. We give people 10 pills and that's about it. And we have a pretty strict policy that you get this medication. You don't treat chronic pain, you know, like the, that's not a thing that we can do. And it's not often that patients even ask to be to like have refills of their medication or anything like that um but w at when back when I started about well I started so I started this job seven years ago and so maybe when I was a couple of years into it we kind of I kind of looked at how well I actually went to a presentation that one of our residents did but kind of looked at how we were prescribing opioids and was it really necessary to one be prescribing the particular one that we were giving because it's a little bit he a heavier I don't know heavier drug um it was allotted at the time and two are we giving patients too many um pills or whatever you know for a prescription and it, you know that led to um I decided that we were going to change to oxycodone because it's not quite as powerful or whatever as as the Dilaudid is and then also reduce the number of pain pills that we were giving the patients and you know we did that for a while and nobody complained about it no you know there weren't it really any more patients that were asking for more pain medications, stuff like that. So I think if that's a thing that providers should think about um, because they are highly addictive. They, um, it can be really easy to get addicted to it. And I think that sometimes patients, um, and not everybody, but sometimes people can use them for potentially things that they're not prescribed for. And so, and you know, in people who are opioid naive, like before surgery, there's apparently with studies and stuff, there's a much higher risk of becoming um, addicted to them, uh, you know, with, with that, that short use rather than people who've been taking them, you know, chronically. Hmm. Um, well, they might already be addicted, but anyway. <laughs> so I think, you know, really, 
they they're you know it's it happened a long time ago right that the drug companies were pushing hey these are great they don't have you know hardly any side effects they're perfect for pain we should give them to everybody and now i think it's become there's this sort of um expectation that people have zero pain ever <laughs> and that's not how life works <laughs> and um so and that that's the only thing that's going to help my pain but there's a lot of other things that can be helpful for pain that i think that you know prescribers nowadays should be aware of and um you know should be things that for people to try um and so yeah i don't i don't feel guilty about prescribing it i i feel like you know in a different setting like if i was a primary care doctor maybe like taking over for someone whose patient was already on medications and they're expecting you to just continue that, like that would be, that probably would make me feel a little bad. Um, and I would, you know, want to try to do something else. Um, in, so I've never had a patient like your friend. Um, so in regard to that, I think it would make me a little bit nervous prescribing um, pain medication to them. Um, you know, I think if they had a different provider who worked with them sort of on their addiction and stuff like that, it would be good to like work with them and, and how are we going to, cause you still want to control people's pain, you know, somewhat, you don't want to leave them with nothing, but you know, how are we going to work to sort of, uh, work together so that it doesn't trigger something, um, you know, that, that brings that addiction back. How do you think medical professionals should go about addressing the opioid pandemic? Do you ever feel guilt uh, when you have to make decisions regarding painkillers? Um, in, in, you know, I, I am in inpatient psychiatry. Um, so I deal with addiction uh, on almost a daily basis. Um, you know, so we have uh, mostly alcohol and right now a lot of meth methamphetamine addiction is actually it, it, amongst the patients I've dealt with has pretty much taken over. I, I, I actually don't remember the last time we had a significant opioid um, patient population that I've dealt with. That, that being said, there it's, it's probably three, right? It's still up there. Um, and I, you know, the, 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 the best way to, to deal with it is to a provide really an unconditional support. Um, humans have a hard time with that. I mean, even families have a hard time with that because um, patients with addiction, uh, the addiction is the primary driver, a good percent of their time. So they, they will, you know, they'll, they'll lie, they will deceive, they'll say they feel better, they're ready to go. They'll say any number of things. Um, and on some level, you almost have to make yourself gullible, as, as odd as that sounds. You know, when your patient comes in and they're in a terrible state and you get them, you get them stabilized. And this is from an inpatient standpoint, right? Uh, you get them stabilized and they're, and they're ready to go and they're never going to touch the stuff again. And you just have to, like, on some level, you provide them with all the support you can. If they are ready to go to treatment, you help them get the treatment, you do what you can. But like, you know, there's a really high chance that what they're saying is like, they're just saying whatever they need to say to get out so they can use again. And you have to like, you kind of have to accept it. I mean, I, I like, like their family is going to tell them they're lying. You know, their friends are going to tell them they're lying or they're going to abandon them. You know, their, their loved ones, um, are going to get frustrated and be like, this, this is the 12th time you've told us you never, you know, that's it. We're not believing you anymore. We're, I don't want to see you again until you're clean, all these things, none of which result in, you know, uh, in, 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 in improvement. Um, so you really just have to be that, like, you have to be a little gullible. You have to be like, okay, that's wonderful great let's let's get you let's get you some resources let's make you some appointments 
and and you just keep doing you know it's one of those things the the the, the classic is like insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results and this is really one of the things where you do kind of the same thing over and over to some extent at least from from our standpoint because um it's not you that's going to change the the person and, and make them ready it's it's them but you have to be there like you have to be the road right like uh it doesn't you don't have to you can't care whether they're there for the fifth time or the first time or the 20th you just have to be there and that's that's the biggest thing i think with treatment and why and why it becomes really frustrating um and then the other one uh as far as feeling guilt it, it, it i don't know i i think there's some element of that i don't know if guilt is the right term for me because i realize that the system now as a whole has become so afraid of of these medications which are medications that were created for a purpose and are effective for that purpose um so we have you know uh i i you know i'm i'm rarely if ever prescribe these medications because it's it's like there's scrutiny and it and and i and i do feel like you know i'm not it's not my main you know pain management isn't the main thing for me right but but like i i you know i hear a lot of times people with like genuine pain or at least what seems like genuine pain who are not able to get these medications because it's just so much of a backswing in the opposite direction how do you feel about needle exchanges and safe injection sites as a response to the opioid epidemic? I think that is fantastic, including like the centers where people can go and they can like be monitored and stuff because you can't just say, just stop using it. Very positive. I think they're one of the, the necessary solutions. All for them. Harm reduction is always a good thing. Because if you've ever tried to quit coffee, like cold turkey. I mean, that's hard enough. I got a massive headache. So I'm like, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that um, being an option for people that want it. Uncertain. Um, I, I feel good about it. I think that there's, there's a whole broader uh, approach that includes that. So it's not just that, whether there's counseling or, you know, other things happening, but yeah, I don't disagree with it. Okay, so yes, I support it. Um, yeah, Barbara summarized it very well. Um, I will say though that um, when I was living in more, I'm in a rural area right now. If I was when I was living in more of an urban area, um, I would not have wanted this type of facility next to me. Mm -hmm. um, just being completely honest, I think it's very great. I just don't want it next to her. So I'm like fully supporting and I'm total NIMBY. The more options, the better. Let the, the people deciding on the treatment themselves and, you know, have the have their morality decide what's, what's appropriate for them rather than us trying to impose it on, on other folks. I'm okay with it. Yeah. I'm very for it. I think it's appropriate and um, I'm glad they have these sites. The point is laparoscopic surgery is less invasive and uh, it is uh, easier for recovery for the donor, okay? Yeah, so since 2003, right, is when you said you had it? Yes. Um, the surgery has become uh, a little bit easier for the donor to recover from it. Um, I, I would say yes to that. And so what was your recovery period like, um, even with, with the open uh, procedure? I was probably in the hospital three or four days. And then the recovery after that, were you limited from strenuous activities for a month or two or? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, and any other restrictions on that diet, um, anything like that? No. Okay. Um, so was there, was, did you have to get a lot of medical screening beforehand? Oh, yeah. Uh, there was screening. Uh, there had to be clearance by a nephrologist. Uh, actually, they had me see a psychiatry to make sure that I was of sane mind. 
Uh, there was a whole host of things and people I spoke to uh, prior to the procedure, probably about four or five steps and uh, before I, the green light was given. Okay. Um, so I, those are like the practical things. When it was, kind of how it happened, and uh, the, the pre-steps. Is there any other like practical things that you think someone thinking about donating their kidney might um, you know, want to know or be aware of? Well, one, one has to be aware of the fact that when you donate, you're basically, you'll have, it doesn't cut your, the donor's kidney uh, efficiency in half. It's more like 40% less. Because hmm. your, your own kidney kind of becomes larger in a sense and it functions at a higher level. But to protect the kidney, I mean, they, for instance, would not want to have a donor with high blood pressure or diabetes or any other chronic ailments. Uh, the, uh, they clearly would, would not want me to take medicine like Advil or Aleve, which are called non-steroidals, uh, to avoid those medications which can affect kidney function. So I've never taken an Advil or a leave since. Hmm. Um, but they said that, you know, as long as I'm in good good health, et cetera, that I should, it shouldn't affect my survival. You donated to your sister. Um, yes. And what were some of the considerations uh, that went through your mind when you decided to do it, when you were maybe thinking about doing it, or um, you know, how, how, how quickly did you come to this uh, decision from um, Aunt Betsy needed one to uh, you donating one? They found out that um, she was in renal failure, even though her creatinine, which is a blood test for kidney function, even though her creatinine wasn't that bad, uh, because of it has to do with the a person's obesity and muscle mass. That's that's a big part of determining what her kidney function was with the creatinine level. Anyway, the point is, she was diagnosed with kidney failure, and she was put on dialysis. Right now, here's the key point as far as I'm concerned. Uh, dialysis is a very difficult thing to go through. Uh, and my sister was on dialysis three times a week, about probably four or five hours each time. And she continued to go for dialysis for about a year and a half. And I was with her several times while she was on dialysis, maybe 10. And I saw what she was going through and I was amazed that she wanted to continue doing it. Hmm. Uh, and that said to me that she had a will to live. Okay? And I was very impressed with that. Her, that she was in that state of mind that she really wanted to live. And then I realized that after a year and a half, well, why don't I consider donating to get her off the machine? And not only is dialysis difficult, um, just the mechanics of it for the patient, there's sticks and this and that, but people don't feel that well on uh, uh, dialysis. Um, they have they feel good for about 24 hours and then they start feeling bad again mm -hmm. so it's a really an up and down kind of experience in terms of quality of life um and so she was dealing with all that pretty well but i just thought it was too bad she had to go through all that suffering yeah definitely um 
So it's really interesting to hear the, the the description of the quality of life because I kept reading about that, how the quality of life for someone on dialysis is substantially lower than the quality of life with someone who does receive a, a kidney donation. Can you do you would you say that uh, the quality of Aunt Betsy's life substantially changed uh, having to not be as dependent on dialysis after the donation? The answer is yes. Um, there's no question about it. But the unfortunate thing was she had these coexisting illness uh, problems, which included obesity. I make the argument, like, I, I present the numbers about um, health care um, in America, how much the kidney program takes up uh, the U.S. health care budget, um, how much cheaper it is for people to be living on um, a, a transplant rather than a, um, you know, on dialysis. Also, just how much better the quality of life is. And then I look at, uh, okay, how much of a risk is it to the donors? How little of a risk? How much the kidney grows in size? How um, actually, statistically, the people who donate their kidneys uh, live longer than the average person. Um, so it's maybe a quirk, but it's like also it's like you don't have much of a risk there. Um, but then also it's just like everyone seems to at least have an obligation to go to the hospital and at least, you know, get the screening for all of it. Because it's like could be up to two hundred thousand dollars in free medical care, just free screening. And so then if you qualify, then I make the argument that you should be a non-directed donor. Um, not just even like, oh, if my friend needs one, I should, uh, you know, donate, but literally like you can start a chain donation um, that, you know, helps, they estimate up to like 100 people is one of my students found an article that said that. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, 12 to 40 people um, are affected by one anonymous uh, non-directed kidney donor. And um, as just someone who is, has done a, a kidney transplant surgery, I guess, like, what do you see as the risks? Like if, if people actually believe me in my conclusion, like what do you think they should be warned about before they just go and be non-directed kidney donors? Um, so I think it would be really good if people would, you know, be able to do it. That being said, every surgery has risks and <clears throat> there are people that suffer um, after um, donation um, I also think one of the saddest things is that when you donate something and the person you've donated to has a complication and doesn't survive, that actually um, is not fun for the person who is the donor. Um, so even though you may personally not have had a complication with your own surgery, when you've donated an organ to somebody and they end up, you know, dying or suffering or whatever it is for their surgery, um, it's not fun for the donor. Um, with that being said, dialysis, while it's a great invention, is a terrible thing in terms of quality of life. Every you know Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're going to the dialysis center. You're sitting there hooked up to a machine for three to four hours, you know, like and you start developing other medical problems because of it. Neuropathies, like you start not getting good blood flow to your feet because of your diabetes and then your toes start to fall off and then we're doing progressive amputations up your leg and it it, it really is like one thing that begets another that and it turns into this very vicious cycle of these people requiring frequent hospital visits for various things and then we just start taking parts of their body because it's, they start dying. Um, so dialysis is one of those things where it's like, it's a life-saving in invention, but it really affects you and going on dialysis immediately affects your, um, length, like your life expectancy. Um, it drops it. It's like by like at least 10 years. Um, so it's, it's significant. And the longer you're on dialysis, the, lower your life expectancy is going to be um, because the organs are not meant to function in that way. Um, and sitting with those toxic chemicals is harmful. Um, so I, I mean, transplant is a wonderful thing. If we could get more people to do it, it would be amazing. Um, but it's not without risk and people do die. Um, 
kidney transplant is less risky than other things like partial liver transplants or things like that. Um, but, uh, still not without risk. So you'd have to really be cognizant of it. With all the advancements in the surgery, with how good we're getting at it, with how it's, you know, kind of an odd, like, um, it's, I guess like, is the risk actually, is it really low? I mean, is it lower than other surgeries? Is it like, no, definitely not lower than other surgeries. Um, so I'm going to, answer your question in a way that I think will help clarify some of this. I don't think that I would donate a kidney to somebody that I don't know. Um, And that is just because for me personally, I don't think the risks of the surgery would outweigh the benefits. Now, you could argue that that's a little bit selfish right? And if we're trying to help the greater good and to decrease the overall cost of healthcare and get people off of dialysis and back living their quality of life, et cetera, it's a little selfish. Um, and that's true, but it is what it is. I, I would not donate an organ to somebody that I don't know. Part of what you brought up the complications with um, the recipient uh, was actually exactly what happened with my and I mean, she didn't have to go to dialysis, you know, three times a week, but she wasn't, she didn't actually have a much better quality of life afterwards. And so that is something that I wasn't really considering uh, when I'm making the argument, when I'm thinking about this, but that's, that's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the reason that I bring that up is because we had a infant who was in liver failure, who her father donated a portion of his liver. And due to the etiology of her liver failure, so like why she was in liver failure, it was a really, really risky surgery because she was also, her liver failure had led to to heart failure. Um, And so we had to put her on cardiopulmonary bypass and um, in a new liver, they need to be anticoagulated and on pump they have to be fully anticoagulated. And so she was bleeding and then we would stop the anticoagulation and then she would clot off the bypass machine. And so then she would go into cardiac arrest because we weren't able to support her heart. And basically for 72 hours, we were in this like terrible scenario of her bleeding and clotting and bleeding and clotting. And finally she had a massive stroke and she died. Um, and for her father, who was the donor, it in more ways than one was like really challenging for him. He is recovering from a pretty big surgery. He just donated part of his liver and, you know, he thought he was going to be doing this good thing, helping his daughter. And then he had to watch her suffer for 72 hours. Um, and he's like going back and forth from his side of the hospital and, um, it, you know, it was like one of those things where it really makes you think about, um, we have a saying, you know, just because I can, doesn't mean I should. Um, it really makes you think about that. Did you develop a pandemic hobby? Like wrangling toddlers, <laughs> like twin <laughs> toddlers. So that's a skill, but I did do bread making for a bit. I was a little scared to try kombucha and I'm trying to knit again, but we're not really in the pandemic anymore. So. No. I tried watercoloring. I learned to take apart and put together a carburetor and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> well, it's, it's a hobby that's ongoing organization. Uh, no, no time for that. <laughs> I went back to school. Yes. <laughs> Um, I don't think so. I got a little more lazy, got a little back pain from sitting on the couch, but I don't think I got a pandemic. No. Whiskey. No, I had a pandemic baby. We did do a lot of hiking. Have you ever worked in a hospital that doesn't provide abortion services due to religious affiliations? 
If so, have you ever seen a case where a mother's life has been in danger due to either the hospital's or hers religious beliefs surrounding abortion? I'm very not involved in that. As a radiologist, I rarely um, have anything to do with. In, in some radiologists do a lot more prenatal or like prenatal imaging and stuff um, than I do. Um, however, coincidentally, today um, we had a case that was the baby was non viable, unfortunately, um, and the placenta had kind of grown through the uterus and was in, involving other things, and it was going to be it's kind of a major deal and. Um, they had asked one of the interventional radiologists if they would intervene. And I don't know the details of the case. It wasn't my case, but I was in the room. Um, and essentially they were worried about the abortion laws. So I, I do think people are thinking about it, right? So it rarely affects me. Um, but although the baby was not viable, it was still a concern. So I do think people are you know, thinking about that. Um, I'd like to think that if it was ever life or death, everyone would be the right thing. Um, but I mean, not to piggyback on the last question, but like, imagine having, you know, three hundred and fifty thousand, five hundred thousand dollars in debt, and worry worried about losing your career. I mean, that's heavy. That's heavy weight, right? So, when I was applying for residency, I applied both for OBGYN and for general surgery. One of the places that I interviewed at for OBGYN. Um, was a Catholic institution that was still run by the diocese. Like they would come by and make visits mm -hmm. and you were not allowed as an OBGYN practitioner to discuss abortion or birth control with your patients. And so I didn't rank this program when I was doing my match list because I was like, I'm immediately going to get fired from this place because I will discuss both of those things with my patients if I think it's appropriate. Um, so for even for really, really high risk pregnancies, like women can go into heart failure when they're pregnant, even for those pregnancies, they were not allowed to mention abortion. They could tell the mother that she could seek a second opinion if she wanted, but they couldn't tell her why <laughs> they could explain all the risks like oh your heart's failing because of the it's not able to handle the volume that's in, in your body and you might die but they wouldn't they couldn't tell her the thing that will stop this process is that if you have an abortion so they can't say that and so they try to manage these women through and a lot of the time they're successful fine um but they're not allowed to talk about it at all. And I personally knew that I would not be able to practice in a place like that. I was like, I'll get fired on day two. Like I, as soon as I see my first patient, I'm going to get asked to leave. Um, and I think that that's like what a lot of people are sort of facing right now is, um, do I uproot my practice and do I leave because my, I can't practice what I know is standard of care medicine and the right thing to do for patients. Um, like, do I leave and I go somewhere where I can do practice medicine the way that I know that I should be practicing medicine or that everyone should be practicing medicine, arguably. Um, but on the flip side of the coin, if you leave, then you're leaving all those patients behind too. Um, and then you have people without access to the care that you could have potentially provided. Um, so I think that's the struggle that a lot of like OBGYN and high risk maternal fetal medicine practitioners are facing right now because they don't want to abandon their patients and they don't want to abandon that whole population of people that they could help. Um, and that they sort of have built their practice in helping. Um, but they also have, you know, significant moral objections to being forced to watch a woman die because she's pregnant. Um, so I think that the those issues are um, 
not going to go away and the religious beliefs and the hospital restrictions um, that are, and now political issues that are causing hospital restrictions. Um, it's just going to be a matter of time before like more than one woman dies because she wasn't able to get an abortion. And unfortunately, in a lot of things in medicine, it takes someone dying before people um, make a change. Um, so it's unfortunate, but it's true. It's the only way you can seem to get like um, policy administrators to get on board because what happens is when somebody dies, then there's a lawsuit and the lawsuit represents money lost. And that is the language that they speak. So that's the way that you get these policy people to get on board. Um, for the political stuff, I don't know if it's going to work the same way. Um, but that would be my guess is that it's going to take something big and tragic in order to make people see that this was not uh, appropriate um, and to allow the OBGYN practitioners the freedom of practice again. Can I ask a follow-up? Um, so I guess, do you think that not offering, not even talking about abort, like saying you have this medical issue and not suggesting that an abortion could resolve this medical issue i mean is there is that just malpractice like do you think that like if the woman were to die that the they're opening themselves up to malpractice suits like is that what you kind of are saying with this someone dying and that like causing change is that what what is it legally that's like you think is their responsibility there what like what yeah if you could talk me through that so that's how i feel about it but legally i don't know if that's the case because the informed consent process. So informed consent process means you explain all the risks, benefits, and alternatives. So in my mind, you're leaving out one of the alternatives, right? You might explain all of the risks and, you know, the benefits, whatever. But in my head, you're leaving out one of the alternatives. And part of informed consent is those three things. Um and then, you know, the patient repeating it back to you, showing that they understand, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's why I personally think that it's malpractice and that it's not appropriate because you're not providing the patient with full information to make an informed decision about their health care. Um, so that's why I think that. However, I think that they, they're able to get away with it because of the way that they probably explain it um, in saying that, you know, you can say there are other options. There are alternatives to continuing with the pregnancy and you can seek a second opinion, um, you know, but you can't like, you know, you can kind of worm around it um, to get to the same point. And I think that that's probably how they find the loophole. Do you think physicians should have communication training required in order to best inform their patients? 100% yes. Uh, they should have formal training. Um, the only situation, I mean, in more structured uh, educational settings, you can do it. Um, it's very hard once you're out of training to have like controlled time. Um, but definitely during medical school and during residency, you should have training and everyone has to do a residency that um that still performs um uh with standard medical practice so there's plenty of people that go to medical school and don't aren't a doctor they still i mean they still are a physician but aren't a practicing medical physician but other than that you have to go through residency so yes you, you should i mean um, it, we communicate all the time i mean you have to do a interview to get into medical school you have to show that you can communicate and it's it's frankly one of the most important things about being a physician but just because you've shown it um or an individual has shown it before um when approaching it on medical topics you should have some specific training uh a lot of reasons why one i, I think people forget how quickly they go into jargon and that's in any sort of um field but people forget how 
what is normal to you is not normal to everybody else. And even before med school, that's, that's, uh, that's very true. A lot of the um, people that we see in the hospital, we have very different just baseline terminologies for anything that we use. And so I, I think it's important to be um, conscious when you're communicating and have that ability to have insight while you're doing it. And that's not something that's very easy um, to necessarily do. And you, you can receive um, plenty of training on it. We had a lot of uh, scenarios. I think pretty much every medical school has what they call um, OSCEs, which are um, uh, observed clinical skills examinations or something like that. But you, you basically have people that are, are, are supposed to be patients and, and have set encounters. And um, they, they're actors who have learned a situation. And, uh, you can have um, role model physicians be able to observe you. And I think it's it's invaluable um, that you do that uh, because, I mean, personally, I think even in my field, so I'm in interventional endoscopy. So I do procedures all the time. When I'm done training, I'm going to be scoping three and a half, four days a week. So most of the time of my patient encounters are going to be when they're under sedation. But at the same time, there's a lot before and after um, that are discussions. And, and even though I'm well, paid for my procedural skills, uh, the procedures themselves, I mean, anybody can learn to do them. The most important thing you do as a physician, regardless of the field, is, is communicate and essentially be an educator. Like you, you have to bring your whatever, six, 10, 15 years of knowledge of, of medicine and allow the person in front of you to experience that for themselves. So you're translating for them, you're teaching them and trying to um, explain everything. And, and, and that's true for anything from a surgeon to definitely primary care or more um, direct patient uh, cares uh, on a daily basis. Do you think physicians have communication uh, or should have communication training required in order to best inform their patients? We do um, have a little bit of training at the, so I work at an academic hospital, right? Um, and so we have a little bit of training that every, all providers have to go through. It's kind of a new thing. Um, and it's not specifically about like consenting patients or anything like that, but it's just kind of how to conduct like a clinical visit with a patient, you know, talking about asking open-ended questions and then, you know, how, uh, to steer the conversation sort of to what the topic is that you're, you know kind of why the patient's there and all that kind of stuff. So we have that kind of training, but I feel like there's not a lot of training in taking these complex um, concepts and, uh, you know, medical procedures and trying to give that to somebody in, at, say, a fifth grade level, um, which is usually kind of where we say, you know, it's best to meet everybody there. And um so that can be hard sometimes to, uh, you know, because obviously it's a different education level than, you know, you kind of are at. But the way that I always thought about it is talking to one of my kids. How would I explain it to them? And now they're older now. <laughs> but, you know, back back when they were little. So, yes, I think it should be required. No, it's not really happening as much as it probably should. And even in like. Uh, medical school, PA school, I don't feel like we get enough training, um, you know, and just how to communicate with people. And I feel like some people have that, right? Just innately, you know, how to talk to people and sort of get um, their understanding um, and where they're at and meet them there. And, you know, some people don't, but it is something that could be trained. If you had $10 million to conduct research on any medical issue, what would you do? You know, $10 million towards smoking sensation is always worth it. It's a big bang for your buck. And probably just as close as obesity treatment. Um, it's probably just as close to a global health and, and national health benefit. So one of the two of those. Uh, mental health. Concussions and brain injury. Obesity. I would try to find a way to improve low back pain because it's something that most people have and it's the thing we can do the least about more emphasis on early detection for heart disease. PTSD. Something to do with cancer 
and finding a, it would probably be one of the more common cancers like pancreatic cancer or something like that, that can be really deadly to see if we could find a more targeted mutation that we can uh, develop like an immunotherapy, not just a chemotherapy for, um, that's less toxic and would provide people with a better treatment plan than death. Well, this is an umbrella general, but uh, finding a cure for cancer. Actually probably donate to that, like understanding why we need sleep and then split the money. Half of it goes to that. And then half of it goes to implementing changes in society that allow us to sleep better. So hello, everyone, uh, all my family members. Uh, good to see you guys. Um, we're here talking about our uh, advanced directives and just how our um, wishes can be respected when we are no longer able to make decisions for ourselves. Um, this is an instance when, you know, not a lot of people think about this, not a lot of people prepare for this, but it can happen out of nowhere and completely unexpected. So the way I teach it in my class and the way I talk about it with my students is that I think it's all of our ethical obligations to tell our loved ones how they can respect our wishes when we're no longer to, you know, express our wishes ourselves. So I think this is an important conversation that everyone should be having. And I would like this to be a bit of a template for anyone to have this conversation with their loved ones to not only express their wishes, but then also to uh, open the door to ask their family members how they can be respected as well. Um, and just to make sure that we're all on the same page about whose medical proxy is who. So that way there's never a fight or a debate about, you know, mom really wanted me to do this. And someone else is saying, no, mom really wanted this. It's like, nope, we're all on the same page about how we can all best respect each other's wishes. Um, so I, I'll just start by um, talking about my advanced directives. So the California advanced directive um, starts with just, you know, medical proxies. So my first medical proxy is uh, Molly, um, this is my sister. Um, I had originally had her as my medical proxy uh, because, you know, she one was living really close to me. So that was a really good reason. Uh, but then two, I also think that if I am in a particular medic, uh, you know, state where I'm not able to make decisions for myself, I'm really concerned about how, you know, my mom's mental state would be. Um, and whether she'd be able to make clear, rational decisions. Um, whereas Molly, um, I've never seen her flustered in her life. And even when she's a little bit flustered, she's still great at like clearly, rationally thinking through and making great decisions. So that was why I chose Molly as my uh, medical proxy, uh, my first one. But, um, you know, they also suggest that you have uh, alternatives as well. Um, so my next option was Aunt Barbara. Um, Aunt Barbara was someone who's, you know, also very... Um, rational, calm, cool, and collected in, you know, stressful situations. Uh, but then on top of that, she had some specific medical care training. So, you know, she's more knowledgeable than just the average person. Um, finally, uh, David, I'd like to ask you to be my third alternative. Um, and the reason I'm asking you to be my third alternative um, is, you know, partly strategic because it's like, if something were to happen to me, you know, and, and this, my main partner isn't here, it's like, I kind of want someone who's a little bit further outside of the circle, but still someone that knows me very well. Um, and I would trust their decision completely. Uh, but then also, um, you know, again, someone who's very thoughtful, someone who's very, you know, methodical and, and just would be able to think things through in a very stressful, very, um, you know, challenging situation. Um, so those are my uh, advanced directives and the people I'd like to be making decisions for me. Um, in California, uh, part two, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, in California, for the part two of the advanced directive, it just asks you about your end of life decisions. Um, and essentially, there's two main choices here, like, you know, uh, choice not to prolong life. And it's, you know, specified specific, uh, you know, situations uh, or you would like your life to be prolonged. Um, I would like to expressly tell everyone now, if it is looking dire, if it is not looking good for me, um, please do not, you know, needlessly keep me alive. Um, that I don't find that to be respectful. I don't find that to be, um, you know, just how I, I would like my body to be treated after that. Um, so in terms of these forms, uh, you can talk about specific pain relief or other wishes. Um, you know, you can add more information here. 
Um, you can also cross things out. So if you know maybe this number one condition isn't you know relevant to you, you can cross that out. And doing that would be um, a way of signaling to your medical proxy that this is something that was important to you that you didn't want that. Um, in terms of organ donations, um, I would like as much of my body to be um, used and donated after I'm gone. Um, whether that's for research, education, therapy, things like that. Um, I understand that sometimes education and research isn't necessarily the most respectful use of a body. Sometimes, um, you know, they're cutting up the body and just trying to see what the nerve endings of the finger look like. And it, they really have to dissect the finger and it doesn't look pretty or respectful. Um, but honestly, that's what I would like done with my body. I would really like it to be um, as useful and for people to get as much information out of it as possible. Uh, I don't really have a primary physician right now. I've been seeing one through student health for the last six years, but I'm not particularly close with him and I don't have, I have not expressed any uh, end of life care wishes to him or any medical um, person at all. Uh, I'd totally be willing to sign this and, um, you know, have this sent out to all of you guys, but, you know, we're not in the same state, so um, we're not going to be able to, you know, officially have this legally notarized or anything like that. But um, I, as, as we were saying, the most important thing is one, choosing medical proxies, and then two, kind of talking about your wishes about how your body can be respected in the end of life care. Um, well, I found the exercise very interesting. And I, I, I think talking about this in general is difficult, uh, which is why most people put it off. You know, they don't want to tackle it. And um, I think talking in specifics is really hard. Um, and some forms, you know, when I was working, I was always looking for different forms. There was one out of Florida called Five Wishes. And they delineated like almost everything, you know, like, can you take a breath now? Can you have anything to eat? Can you, you know, if this, and it was too overwhelming. I think I tried to go through it with my mom and, you know, you just don't, you don't want to be put to death if you can live, if there's viability. Right. And, and, but on the other hand, as Becky said, if, if, um, you know, you have advanced cancer, um, you're terminal. And in my paperwork going over it, because I did this in 08 in Missouri, um, they required two physicians to make the decision about whether my life is um, terminal or not. And so I think in some ways, although it, the, the you need to talk about the broader care uh, characterization rather than the specific. And if the person uh, really important that your proxy is on board and number one, that you've had conversation with your proxy and told them, and then that they're on board and they're able to carry out your wish even if maybe they're uncomfortable with it. And I've seen people, you know, with proxies and the proxies can't do it when it comes right down to it. When when you've seen or, or heard of instances when the proxy doesn't feel comfortable or empowered or able to in whatever way to fulfill the, um, you know, patient's wishes, um, if you, if you if I think that's going to be an issue, should I choose a different proxy? Should I have more serious conversations with them? Or what what would you recommend in that situation there? Yeah, I think that that this is more than just stating a proxy. You have to have a relationship with that proxy. The proxy has to know what your intimate thoughts are on the subject and then do that every once in a while because that could change. You know, if you marry and have a family, obviously your paperwork's gonna change and how you feel about things might change. So that's an ongoing conversation. And that's that's really important. I mean, you just don't put a name there because you need to fill a name out. Um, and the other thing is once you've done this, you have to give copies of this to everybody. And that 
pretty much says so in the paperwork that I read. You want to give it to your primary doctor. You want to give it to any other doctor. I mean, I'm an oncologist. Make sure that they have it. Certainly that your proxies have it. Um, and just about anybody, you know, anybody you can think of that might be involved in what's happening, they need to have a copy of it because for you to do it and put it in your safety deposit box and that nobody has a key to um, is not really effective. The other thing that was helpful to me, Tom, is going over the paperwork is um, back then I had named my brother Jay as my second proxy. And Melissa was always my first. Um, and I'm like, well, that doesn't really apply anymore. You know, I think that my kids were a little bit younger and not settled or whatever. And um, so going over my paperwork, I'm like, I think I'll make, maybe make Dan second proxy because he's grown up. Hallelujah. Um, and of course, Colleen is so far away. So, and Tim, well, Tim's just a little unreliable. So, um I, I don't see him as the person. He doesn't have a phone. You couldn't reach him anyway. I'd be, you know, buried before you got a hold of him. So, so that's helpful to me because I need to revisit that and change some names. You know, it's Becky first and then the Eldridges, both, actually both of them in my case, so John and Annette, since that was an option as uh, co-agents. And then the third was uh, Christina Rodriguez, who's, um, uh, you know, the godmother. <laughs> you know her, Tom. Um, yep. And so she's uh, someone I trust and also would trust to make the, the right decisions or decisions that I was comfortable with. Um, and then the the information too, like um, with respect to withholding life, life-sustaining treatment in cases where it's a terminal condition or irreversible condition, that's how they distinguish it here in Texas. The actual third option that, that wasn't on the forms um, that you had circulated was one where, um, you know, I elected to have my doctor and my agent, whoever my agent is at the time, make the decision rather than um, me expressing one. Because I, I feel like in those two cases, it it really doesn't matter to me. Um, I would rather have like whoever it does matter to, like whether I, you know, in, those two, in, the, in the two cases with those conditions, like if it makes a difference to to someone that the physician and the agent would be in the best position to decide like, oh, it's, you know, in this case, because of X, Y, and Z reasons, it makes sense to prolong care for one life. Um, it, I really have no, no preference <laughs> um, in my case, so. All right, Becky. Mine's the same. So, so you're actually, you have a different third. Oh, on this, what was mine? It was MRT. And your second is actually just. Oh, yeah. Know. Mr. T. <laughs> no, no. Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so uh, our primaries are the same? Well, with each other. Yeah. With each other. And then um, Mr. T is my second. So, again, that's Molly's initials or a nickname for me. Like, it's really good if you're actually oh, clear about which funny. one of us oh, you're choosing. It's, it's Molly. It's clear on the document. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and then, Becky, did you have any thoughts? Did you read through the um, document about uh, advanced care? Um, you know, uh, the same where it's the agent and the physician. And yeah, like my physician and agent will decide. So oh, yeah. I, I have a question about that, potentially as your agent. Um, <laughs> um, if you, so you, ha you have stated that you don't want your life prolonged, but you give your agent and your doctor the power to make that no, decision. She, so she hasn't stated that she does not, not want it prolonged. She, there's okay. no statement as to uh, withholding or do not withhold. It's my agent and the doctor can decide. It's the third choice. Okay. Had. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Well, I mean, we talked about it last night where it was if if you needed to continue like keeping someone on a ventilator or something so they could someone could come and say goodbye or something like that. But if there was really no uh, no chance of resuscitation, 
right, then, like, to me, I'm like, I'm totally fine with you pulling. I can't, I'm trying to <laughs> pull a plug. <laughs> I'm trying to use adult words. The adult phrase is cessation of treatment. Pulling the plug is very metaphorical and there's no actual plug that gets pulled. Uh, cessation of life-sustaining treatment is the medical term that they use. Thanks. Okay. So that's how I, how I feel about it, Molly. I recently had a head injury and I think that that the examples that we've given so far are, um, they're clean cut. So it's like, I'm on my deathbed, I'm terminal with cancer, like that's what I'm going to do. But if you're in a situation where, um, like let's say I had been in my accident and I had been in a coma. Um, and like Aunt Barbara said, that she, if, if she had needed two doctors to say that, um, you know, there, there has to be a, a sort of a consensus opinion on what the, what the diagnosis is. And I think that, that, um, that it's really difficult for us to have the conversations with our proxy of all the different situations that might be, um, when the diagnosis isn't that clear cut. Um, and I guess, yeah, I, I, I think that my proxy, who is my husband, um, I think that he would probably need the support of the secondary, the secondary, I don't know if I use that right, secondary proxy, the secondary agent, which would be you, Tom. <laughs> you made a joke this morning that you should make your philosophy teacher your proxy. <laughs> so you're not my teacher, <laughs> but you are, you are my, uh, my agent. So I don't know, it's a conversation that evolves. And I think as we see our friends in different situations, um, it's, it's a conversation that evolves. So our mom is on this call. Um, and <laughs> um, I did not include you mom in the, the first two um, agents. I don't, I haven't thought about a third. Um, I would put you probably, gosh, I don't know if I would put you third. I think I would probably put my sister-in-law. And the reason I say that is Tom kind of described this, but I, I don't feel like you're Tommy made it almost seem like she's unreliable. <laughs> um, but I know that's not, that wasn't your intention. Um, it's that some people, I wouldn't want to burden you, mom. I feel like you would be, you would be very overwhelmed and I wouldn't want to put that burden on you because I feel like you would be going through enough just in that situation. And so I feel like in some situations, not choosing someone is almost a gift of peace. Um, but then that means that you're putting that burden on someone that you think could handle it. And yeah, so I love you, mom. I don't want to put you in that situation <laughs> where you have to, where you have to think about it and worry about it. No, and I wouldn't want to be your third person. Um, I would like to be maybe involved in the discussions yeah. um but as far as being your third agent no mm -mm. thank you molly yeah all right mom last um, one gosh have you did you get a chance to look through the uh colorado advanced directive and living will forms yeah, yeah, I, I didn't fill them out, but okay. So I, okay, I looked at them and um, um, have you chosen uh, a medical proxy uh, and two alternatives? Yes, I have. Um, Molly is number one, and then just Becky, and then you. All right, mom, I'm not gonna let you off the hook that easy. Um, I think the main reason I wanna really have this conversation with everyone is so we all know your answers. You said that uh, three people on this call are your first, second, and third uh, medical proxies. Uh, things we'd like to know are um, you know, your thoughts on life-sustaining procedures. Would you generally like uh, life-sustaining procedures or uh, would you like, uh, you know, that life-sustaining procedure should be discontinued. Again, if you are in a, um, if you have a terminal condition or in a persistent vegetative state for a prolonged amount of time. 
Um, would you like pr life sustaining procedures to continue or are you all right with them being withdrawn? I'm all right with them being withdrawn. Um, now I'm 69 years old. So um, I think I've led a pretty good life so far. I hope I have many more years to come. Um, but certainly if I'm in a, if they're, if I am terminal or if I'm in vegetative state, don't keep me alive. If you could change one aspect, rule, or norm of the healthcare system, what would you change? I have two. I'm sorry. But okay. the first one is uh, fixing the pipeline of new physicians. Um, there's a limited space for physicians to train in residency. And with all the burnout, especially with COVID right now, um, there's just not enough doctors and we're all feeling it when we try to schedule appointments and it's just mm -hmm. ridiculous um, for there to be such a lack of support. Um, so secondarily, I would um, hope that there will someday be an increased accessibility to inpatient psychiatric care. The billing system. What I would change is that healthcare is available to everybody. I would hope that we have more providers and nurses that we are able to reach uh, more poor city people and people in the rural areas to get the act to get the care that they need and to have less fear that they have for the uh, medical system Probably insurance companies' refusal rights of tests that we've ordered. Oh, you know, that's a good one. More autonomy to physicians as far as for um, uh, less less insurance oversight. I mean, that's, that's a huge thing. It's like, all right, I know what I want to do. I know what's the right thing to do. And then I want to, I, we just want to go through with it. And a lot of times they say, you know, with, with med specifically, a lot of times like, well, you got to try this one first before you try this one. But um, Oh, definitely um, free for everyone. I would change insurance completely, probably to a one payer system. I think education and respecting personal choices. I want everybody to have affordable health care coverage so they don't go bankrupt for reasons outside of their control. I mean, I I provide health care for everyone. <laughs> yeah, I you know. Yeah, make it available to everyone and don't bill anyone anything. Like <laughs> the thoughts on American healthcare system and what changes would you like to see? I, I'm I I try not to think of myself as a pessimist, but I have a somewhat pessimistic view on the ability to to fix the health system because um it it is it has evolved in this chaotic way with um you know, with kind of bandage fixes to certain things, um, you know, that we have insurance companies and we have uh, federal insurances, or, you know, or state insurances, and we have drug companies and we have separate research companies. Um, and everyone seems to be kind of working independently. Um, and, and there's a lot of careers built around all these different moving pieces. Uh, so even the, the concept of like saying, you know, I believe we should provide universal coverage. Um, I have no idea what that means, right? Does it mean that everyone should get a basic minimum coverage where they see their primary doc, whatever, but they, you know, but they have to wait a long time unless they have a special insurance they can pay for, which allows them to see certain other, you know, gives them premiums well does that does that put us into a you know is that does that put us into a different pro set of problems um is the high cost of med school tuition why there's a shortage of medical resources in this case doctors would lower tuition improve this phenomenon it's tricky and the reason why i want to answer this one is because it's confusing and a lot of the lay public doesn't understand where the cash flow is and what this what the situation is so i figured i would try my best to explain it um not necessarily so in general, medical school is expensive. We're talking on the magnitude of about $100,000 a year times four years. I'll even 
put my number out there. I know my salary is never going to get sympathy as a physician, right? It's not going to get sympathy. And I don't need sympathy. I, I'm very comfortable. Um, but to put it like, for example, and this is when interest rates were lower. I have about $350,000 in debt. And my loan payment is $4,000 a month. Um, so if you're in a lower paying specialty, I mean, after taxes in, in the tax bracket, um, you know, that's not an insignificant amount of money. And I had no undergraduate loans. So imagine adding undergraduate loans to that. I mean, I know people who are over half a million dollars in debt. So now you're talking like $6,000 a month. Um, it's substantial. There are barriers to care or barriers to this process though, for people who don't aren't used to dealing with numbers of that magnitude. So if you grew up in a middle class or an impoverished household, the whole process of applying for the loan, understanding how the loan works, um, talking to people with financial advice to give might not be something that's an option for you. Maybe nobody in your family has taken a loan out before or certainly a loan of this size. So I think that that definitely the sticker shock definitely keeps people out of it, not even understanding what this process looks like because maybe they have a single parent and the parents live in paycheck to paycheck, the parent doesn't own a home and the student is like, I can't take a loan out like that. They're never gonna approve me for that. You need some semblance of credit to get this loan in the first place and there's a whole equitability discussion around who gets credit and whether credit's a good system to base this off of. But if you're born into poverty, you're, nobody can co-sign. Your parent doesn't have any credit. And you don't have any credit. It's going to be very difficult to get this initial starter loan. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. By lowering the cost of tuition and decreasing that debt, yeah, um, you, you will encourage people to go into um, primary well, specialties, specialties like okay. family medicine, internal medicine, um, Infectious disease, although it's a fellowship, it's, it doesn't pay very well. Um, things like that that are important, um, pediatrics. Um, but I think a lot of people are scared. They do the math and they see what they owe and they're scared. Um, even if that might be their interest, they're scared to do it financially. Because, right, I'm just getting started in my career uh, and I'm, what, 34? So no retirement savings at 34, that's... Um, you know, a lot of people that I know and, you know, I mean, when you take the long academic path, they've been saving for 12, 13 years. So you're playing catch up on that. You're also, you know, have these massive student loans you're dealing with. And I don't fault people for thinking about the finances so long as it's not their primary consideration. But I do think if you were to alleviate the financial stress of medical school, you would see people more willing to go into these really important kind of, you know, central specialties. One of the reasons that we have a shortage of doctors is not due to decreased supply of medical students. It's often due to the limited supply of residency slots. So in order to practice medicine in the United States, you need to complete some semblance of residency. In some states, after a year or two, you can be a general practitioner, but in most states, in order to practice in your field, internal medicine in my case, or critical care in my fellowship case, you have to do additional training and then become board certified in that specialty. The number of residency slots are controlled by the federal government. So the Center for Medicare Services, CMS, funds my salary. So whatever the resident salary is, which is usually pretty modest, they're all publicly available online, but they're in the order of usually $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 a year. That's funded by the federal government. The federal government pays your hospital like one hundred and twenty dollars to $150,000 per resident per year to cover your salary and the cost of educating you. So the additional money to your clinical instructors, um, your call rooms, your resident lounge, all the things that come along with that medical education. <laughs> and that those residency slots are controlled by Congress and the uh, sort of the budget, um, uh, how much money is budgeted to the, to CMS and how much money CMS is able to dole out and et cetera. And it's very tightly controlled. So my residency program, for example, if they want more residents than they have per class, they have to talk to the state who has to talk to the federal government and a bunch of bureaucrats effectively have to give the thumbs up for that to happen. As you can imagine, the flow of money through the federal government at the state and the federal level is not like a fast process nor a very clear process. And historically, the government has not really opened up the purse strings over the last couple of decades. They recently did it within the last couple of years, and I think they added maybe a couple hundred residency spots, but definitely not one that's going to, right, we have a shortage of like tens of thousands of positions. Um, there's new medical schools opened all the time in the United States. We have enough residency spots for all the U.S. students. As you know, Tom, I went to an international medical school, and there's tens of thousands of more international medical students every year entering the match, the process for assigning you to a residency. 
And most U.S. medical students match into a residency spot. A lot of international medical students, so whether that's someone like me, who's a U.S. citizen that goes to school abroad, or somebody who went to medical school abroad who took their licensing exams and is trying to get a residency spot in the U.S., like half of them go unmatched every year. So we're talking like 10 or 20,000 potential physicians every year due to our bottleneck of residency spots. There's definitely something to be said about should we allocate taxpayer funded spots to U.S. citizens or people trained in the U.S.? It's a complicated question. I don't have a great answer for it. I'm happy that I was able to go to international medical school and then be trained through the U.S. to become a licensed physician. Um, But that is really the pinch point is the number of residency spots. Now, you need lots of things to have a residency gap. You need a hospital. You need a diverse and robust patient population. So you're seeing lots of cases. You need the technology. You need specialists in your field. So it's not quite as simple as just throwing more money at it. But also a part of it is throwing more money at it. So in order to really expand this bottleneck of physicians, we need to expand the number of training sites for physicians because it's not a supply. It's it's There's a supply and there's a demand. So there's like an external non-market driven force that is just crunching everything together in the middle and that's why they're mismatched so the cost of tuition and the money needed to like apply to medical school take practice courses for your mcat like all those things there's definitely an equitability component to that where it's very hard for people from underserved communities to get to medical school but then there's also this big pinch of all these possible people you know uh, from whatever u.s international medical schools who want to be practicing physicians in the u.s who are qualified who are competent who take and pass all these licensing exams and it has to be better funded how often do patients values conflict with your own so so i specifically work in bariatric surgery which is weight loss surgery and so i guess you know in thinking about it like that way there are a lot of times when I feel like a patient's not quite ready for surgery yet and they would like to have surgery yesterday. Um, so that happens quite a bit, but, you know, we just, I, you know, would explain to them that, you know, this is what we're trying to do and we are trying to get you the best outcome for after surgery. And so we need you to do these things up front. Hmm. Um, not often. Uh, not, not, not terribly relevant to me usually in radiology. Somewhat regularly, but both of our values at the end of the day is taking care of the patient. So even if they seemingly conflict, usually we can find common ground. Rarely. Most of the time, most of the time patients are asking for help and they listen to what I, you know, um, we definitely run into patients who are psychotic, who, who, who have different values to their treatment, but that's a different story. <laughs> so we definitely run into that. <laughs> um, every once in a while, like maybe 10 to 20% of the time. You know, sometimes I, I think I, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, I'm more apt in a professional situation to listen. So I, I want to hear who the other person is, what their wishes are, where maybe if that time, where it came from, why they feel that way. I try to put myself totally secondary. So yeah. it, it's not like a competition. They're, they're feeling versus how I feel. Have you ever witnessed any blatant violations of ethics by other medical professionals in your workplace? I hate that one. But it's true. I mean, there's there are blatant blatant ethics violations. I think I we see them, um, unfortunately. Um, but it's not just coming from the physicians, right? Uh, um, so every once in a while, I'll see a physician who I I think might be doing like maybe a little bit too much, um, maybe being a little too aggressive, and happens to be that the, the aggressive things are doing with pay, right? I will say. Um, that a that is not very common in, in radiology it's kind of a unique situation right like people miss all the time like most of the time it's insignificant but i mean if, if you think about it for example like i'll read you know unfortunately i don't want to re- have to read this much but they all need to be read so i don't know what else to do i mean i'll, I'll read you know 40 CTs in a day, 
plus a bunch of ultrasounds and a bunch of x-rays sometimes. And then, and if you factor in that each CT has almost a thousand images, I mean, obviously you're scrolling them in a stack, but I mean, it, it's, it's impossibly perfect. We're human. You have to stay focused, right? Fortunately, I don't see a lot of major misses, lots of little incidental things that don't really matter. Um, but I do think like sometimes if someone missed a tiny nodule that I almost certainly would have missed one, two millimeters, but then you have the luxury of the follow-up and not the luxury, that's the wrong way to put it, but in it's six millimeters, you know, now substantially larger, a lot easier to see, but previously almost undetectable. Um, and you look back and you saw they missed it. Like, I can't fault them for that. I'm not going to say they missed it. I'm not going to say it's new. I'm just going to say it's there, right? I'm not going to throw them under the bus for a potential lawsuit. Um, and I think it's like, I mean, we all have to take care of each other. I mean, to some degree, right? If there's an egregious miss, and I thought someone was acting maliciously, that's totally different. Totally different. So are there any any type of classes in uh, in medical school during residency regarding empathy and how to handle patients with their family? Well, empathy is hard to teach. Let's just put it, let's just kind of put it bluntly because empathy is a, it, it is a, um, in, in many ways, like a reflex, uh, compassion, you can, you can teach and explain and, and, and help understand which, you know, compassion a lot of times is based on understanding, uh, sympathy, um, and pity, those kinds of things. Um, but empathy is, has to do more with our ability to mirror and, 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 uh, it, um, it, I'm trying to think of the term, but, but basically co-feel, right? Um, it, not everyone has that capacity equally. Um, and it's not, you know, and it is a good thing for me personally, I have found it to be a, a, a very beneficial and powerful tool, but it all, I, I can also find how empathy can get problematic because sometimes you feel a lot more for, you know, for some patients than for others, because you, connect to them a little bit more effectively. Are there any types of classes in medical school or during residency regarding empathy or how to handle patients and their family members during difficult situations? We had one lecture out of, you know, the whole two years I was there and the and kind of the, the four years, I guess, the med students are there, but one lecture about delivering bad news. <laughs> and from what I remember of it, 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 the, or the biggest thing is that you, if a patient had, if a patient has died, you use that specific language, you don't, you know, you, so that people understand what you're saying, that you don't say we lost them or, <laughs> you know, they're gone or whatever. Um, and so I, but I think that the one thing with going through like the, rotations that you do in either PA or medical or uh, yeah, medical school, you get to see different situations. And because you work with a lot of different providers over that time and a lot of different areas, you get to see um, sort of different ways that people do or deliver bad news or talk to patients about, you know, things that may be upsetting or whatever. Um, on my, one of my rotations we did, um, it was palliative care, um, which is a lot of talking to patients about terrible things. You know, it's a lot of terminal illnesses or very sick things, goals of care, things like that. And I think I learned a lot on there too. Um, you know, there's a way to be empathetic to people and yet still straightforward to kind of, uh, you know, get what you need to tell the patient across, but then, you know, have good listening and stuff to them. And so I think le likely that's more effective in just like dealing with other providers and sort of seeing how they handle the situations. How do you deal with having to deliver bad news to patients? Are there certain strategies you use? So I frequently will be the first person to tell someone they have cancer. Um, we, uh, an interventional endoscopy are, are frequently biopsying the pancreas or or um, other areas where we are, are sampling tissue or lymph nodes um, and we'll have the pathologist look under the microscope and they'll tell us, yeah, that looks like cancer. And so frequently we're the first ones to tell people that they have cancer or that they have recurrence of their cancer. Um, I think there's, a, there's several important things that you need to do 
uh, is one, not just jump to it. Most of the time when you're talking to people, uh, at least in my situation, a lot of times they're, they're recovering from anesthesia. So, you know, they may be nauseous, they may have a headache or something else. You say, you know, how are you feeling? Make sure that you're actually addressing, you're not just getting something off your chest um, saying, oh, hey, this is the diagnosis. Um, but um, setting the stage that you care for them as a whole person and what's going on. And then two, you'll probably, um, probably as a theme, but it, it's very important to be, to know your physical language when you're doing it. Um, so a lot of times in these encounters are either in the hospital, you know, in, in inpatient beds or recovery bays, um, you, the patient will be in a, in a bed and then people will be standing over them. So it's important just to just grab a chair, sit down, look at them and say, um, you know, right now it looks like it is cancer. We don't always have definitive diagnosis and then call them back later and tell them, um, but to tell them, yes, right now, this looks like it's cancer. It's also very important if you are concerned is to tell them beforehand. So you start the, every time I start a procedure, um, I ask someone, uh, what are we here to do today and why are we here to do it? And then they give you an answer and you tell them right now, you know, we're concerned that it's this. So um, for instance, a, a high um, suspicious word is a stricture. So people will come in and say, oh, I've got a stricture or narrowing or there's a blockage in my bile ducts. And you say, has anyone told you what it might be, it might be from? And then you give them, you know, an honest differential. You say, you know, we see it from scar tissue forming after bile duct stones, or sometimes it can be a growth within the bile duct that we call cholangiocarcinoma, which is a form of cancer. And they go, oh, and sometimes they, they already know. Um, so there, you find a lot of times in healthcare, um, patients already know. I mean, everyone has Google, everyone has the internet, and it doesn't take too many keywords to put in there for cancer or something scary to come up. So if they haven't asked you about it already, they've probably already thought about it. And if you can bring it up um, or at least address it, it, I think it and partially it, it, it validates them that they're not just putting their symptoms or their concerns under the rug. And then when you go to talk to them afterwards, um, there is sort of that, okay, there's a, there's a little bit of understanding beforehand. Um, so back to after you, you tell them, you make sure that you're in um, a very good body language. And then um, after that, you just sit, you just, you know, it can, it can feel like a lot, but literally you just wait five seconds, let them say the next words. They'll say, you know, whatever's coming on their mind. Some of them more often than not, um, most people are, are um, obviously upset, but want to know what the next steps are more so than like have a complete breakdown. I have seen it a few times, but, um, but generally most people are just, okay, what's next. And um, it, I think it's important to be optimistic, but not, be patronizing uh, with people when they ask you about when you tell them bad news um, and they ask you what's next or how are people going to do uh, to, to say, you know, set some legitimate expectations. Um, so in most care, most of the part in healthcare, we're doing a lot better. We are doing better with cancer. We're not curing people um, of all their cancers, but people are living a lot healthier and, and longer lives. I mean, pancreas cancer is still people, um, I mean, five-year mortality rate is still above 90, um, but people are living longer. So instead of being three months, they're living 13 months. And that can be, that's a huge difference. Um, and being honest with people and saying, hey, people are living a lot longer. I'm seeing people come back for repeat procedures um, and there's, it's constantly evolving, but it is, um, you know, a, a tough situation that then that can be very, very difficult. So. Is it possible to be too moral as a medical health professional? I feel like that's kind of a good, I, mm, I. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's possible to be too moral. No. I don't think so. Although I think um i don't think so you can maybe get a little stuck in stuff sometimes but um i don't think so no 
Well, I guess it depends on your morals a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because yeah. I feel like you shouldn't put your religious beliefs on other people. Um, no, in so much as you always need to be cognizant of morals and medical ethics. Yes, if it affects your ability to make a decision, because at the end of the day, you're tasked with making a decision or at least guiding the patient to a shared decision. I don't know. Like you, yes. So yes, I guess you could, yes, you could be too moral if that's what you consider your morals. No, but no one likes a woke supremacist basically asking about the distinction between active euthanasia and passive euthanasia, passive euthanasia being defined as the cessation of treatment. In my practice, I don't use the verbiage passive euthanasia ever because I think it would be probably misleading, um, especially in the like the family meetings that I'm involved with. But I understand the distinction and the concept of cessation of treatment, which we do all the time. Um, <clears throat> you know, in my practice, cessation of treatment is uh, stuff that we do routinely. So whether it's the patient or the patient's legal surrogate, depending upon who's actually able to speak on the patient's behalf, um, everybody's with some exceptions allowed to not want medical intervention. We can't force medical intervention on people um, if they are decisional or they have a decisional surrogate who says, no, stop. Even if we think they should keep going, that doesn't mean that we might not have an impassioned discussion with that patient about why we think they should keep going. But, uh, and this has been the case for many, many, many years, we, you know, we cannot strap somebody to the bed and force medication in their arm if they don't want it. It's like a fundamental principle of, of what we do. <clears throat> Active euthanasia, I think aptly defined as intentional killing is basically what we think of, we think of physician assisted suicide. So a patient wants to die and more so than just removing medical interventions to keep them alive, a physician ultimately, or a provider is writing the prescription and or administering the medication that kills them. So a lethal dose of medication, whether it's a lethal dose of a barbiturate or a sedative or a potassium, um, like used to be used in lethal injection. Um, so <clears throat> passive, passive euthanasia being we stop doing things that are keeping you alive and allow nature to take its course is the important component part of that. And active euthanasia being we're overriding nature and we are ceasing your life. So obviously in most states, including the state I practice in, active euthanasia is illegal. Um, and some would argue a violation of our Hippocratic Oath, although that's a complicated question with complicated answers. Um, I think this is, there was a pretty high profile case about this in the news recently where an ICU physician was palliating somebody at the end of the life. And this is where I think this distinction gets very blurred. So this happens a lot in the intensive care unit where we have a patient who we've exhausted all of our medical treatment. They're ill to a point of medical futility. We can't do anything to save them, unfortunately. So we often sit down with the family and tell them our recommendation is to let nature take its course and we will try to keep them as comfortable as possible. And that as comfortable as possible is something that we have to be very deliberate and considerate of what we're doing. Because what that means um, in sort of layman's terms is we give them medications like morphine um, and benzodiazepine, so like IV versions of Xanax, so that they're not uncomfortable, they're not struggling to breathe, they're not in distress, because nobody, no patient or their family wants their loved one to die in a way that's distressing. Everybody hopes for themselves to have a peaceful death. What becomes very tricky is the dose and the frequency and the amount and why we're giving those meds becomes important. So I guess said a little more cl clearly, we have to titrate or give doses of these medications to the patient's comfort, not to their death. So, um, you know, a practical example of this I can give you is morphine is a, is a pain medication. We give it IV, but it's particularly helpful against something we call air hunger. So when the body is not getting enough oxygen or the body's not expelling enough carbon dioxide, the body experiences uh, uh, something we call air hunger, which people would recognize if they went under a pool and held their breath for 45 seconds. So that feeling with which you need to breathe, that sort of biological imperative air hunger um, starts kicking in. And that happens in the act of dying process and it can be very uncomfortable. And that's why some people, if not treated, through the dying process, will gasp for breath, will struggle to breathe. Often they have pulmonary edemas, their sort of cardiovascular system collapses, and it can be very uncomfortable. Morphine and opiates in general override that air hunger. This is why, to a much lesser extent, opiates are a pretty good cough suppressant. That's why codeine is in cough medicine. It, it The centers in the brain that are involved in air hunger, the cough reflex, et cetera, it sort of suppresses those. So it can be very effective in somebody who's actively dying so that they aren't experiencing respiratory distress. But if we give enough morphine 
it will kill them. If we give a big enough dose too fast all at once, it will completely stop their drive to breathe and they'll have a cardiac arrest and they'll die. So when we write these orders and when we talk to the people who are going to be administering these drugs, which are often ICU nurses, we make it very explicit. We are titrating this medication to the patient's comfort. We are to give this for air hunger. Once the patient stops showing signs of air hunger, we are not giving bigger doses of this medication unless they start showing signs of air hunger again. So another medication we use to do this is fentanyl, which people are familiar with in terms of it being a contaminant in drugs of abuse. Um, but it's, it's very useful as a pain medication and a sedative in the hospital setting. It's given IV. Um, and we give fentanyl sometimes at the end of life for some sedation and to help safeguard against air hunger. But there's what would probably be accepted as reasonable doses in the practice of palliative care. And then there are unreasonable size doses. So we dose fentanyl on the order of micrograms. So a typical dose of IV fentanyl given as a push, as a one-time dose of the medication is like 50 to 100 to 150 micrograms of fentanyl, depending upon how big the patient is, how much pain medicine they've been receiving previously, et cetera. Um, there was a pretty high profile case <clears throat> and where it was escapes me, but a physician in the intensive care unit gave a thousand micrograms of fentanyl at once as a one-time dose to somebody who was in the active dying process that they were palliating. And it went to court. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this physician was, was tried and convicted for physician assisted suicide. I have to fact check that. Um, but that, that was, that was the sort of the court case brought against the physician by the state was you gave an inordinately large dose of this medication that is not standard of care to help somebody in the act of dying process. Um, and I remember reading the news article and looking at the dose of fentanyl that, they, that this person gave and thinking, oh my God, like that is that is a huge dose of this medicine. Now, I don't want a Monday morning quarterback this doctor. I don't know anything about the patient's care. The patient could have been on a fentanyl drip for weeks and weeks and weeks, which would mean that they would need a pretty big dose of this to be effective because the body develops a tolerance. I don't know what kind of distress the patient was in. I don't know the specifics of the situation, so I can't really pass a moral or a legal judgment on this physician. But I do know that's a huge dose of fentanyl, and that's something I probably wouldn't be comfortable giving for those reasons, because now we're venturing into the territory where this dose of the medication may kill the patient. When we talk about palliating and treating somebody's active symptoms of dying, we explain to families that it may, in some instances, hasten the dying process. So if we give people enough morphine so that they don't have air hunger, they're going to breathe slower. They're still going to breathe because we're not giving them a big enough dose to end their life. But breathing slower is not going to slow down the dying process. It may accelerate it. So we have to be very careful in terms of the informed consent we're getting from the family or the patient when we explain this to tell them, this isn't going to stop them from passing. This may actually expedite the process, but an important distinction is it's not going to do it. Nature is going to do it. So that's what we strive for. And, in, you know, in that, like I said, in that uh, court case in particular, I was like, that's a big dose. If I have to give a dose that big, I'm finding another combination of medications to try to achieve the same result, specifically because I don't want to cross over that very gray area in the situation into active euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide. Considering your medical knowledge, uh, how would you react if you found out have some life-altering disease? Good question. Um, I think it depends on the disease. I think I would forego I'd be more likely to forego some of these hardcore last ditch procedures. Um, and maybe I'm a little biased in radiology, honestly, um, because generally the people who only get imaging after these procedures are <laughs> the people who didn't do well. So like my, like the cohort I see is the, probably the ones that are doing the worst, but I, I do think that um, seeing some of the outcomes, I would, I would be hesitant. I, to, to, you know, do some of these last like ditch major procedures. I'd think I'd rather just spend time with my family and I'm not giving yeah. anyone medical advice if they have, I think that's a discussion to have. Um, and I, it would vary drastically based on the condition, but. Since the conflict between doctors and patients has been more serious in recent years, uh, do you think the government should set any special laws, uh, regulations to protect healthcare workers? Uh, Man, uh, I, I feel like whenever we start regulating things, we find new problems that we have created. And uh, I, I think the biggest thing that government could do, and I think that was one of the things that we've run into in the last few years, is just 
much more transparency. I think when it comes to science and healthcare communication, especially, I think one of the things that I noticed that we ran into is that we used to always complain kind of like within the medical field, so to speak, we used to always complain that like, well, these people who are spreading lies, they can say whatever you want. They can say it definitively, but we can only say, you know, well, within reasonable doubt or within this much confidence, right? Because that's what the studies show. The studies, can, science doesn't prove anything definitively. It, it can prove something, right? So, so, that, so that was always kind of like this ongoing complaint, pet peeve with science communication. And I think what we found out with during COVID is that there were some scientist communicators who did say things that were not massive, not necessarily supported, or at least not as, as well supported. So there were some things that were said definitively before we even really had clear data on it. And I think that has led to way bigger problems in return, in the end, you know, so, so speaking uh, like uh, right in the beginning saying, Hey, here's what we have. This is this disease. Here's vaccines. Here's this, this is what we know they do. But here's what we don't know. We don't know 100% they do this and this and this. We think they will. That is how it, 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 it's all, it's about communication. And I think liars that are out there are going to lie and we can't stop them. That's part of our society. So, I mean, protection, I don't know what kind of additional protections you could have for physicians other than just, you know, support them and, and provide just very, very honest and, and, transparent communication. If you could go back in time to some point during your education or medical career, what would you have done differently? I have a really hard time with like the going back and changing time questions as far as, because I have that butterfly effect. I'm like, well, I have three kids now. What if I do something different? Is that going to change this kid? You know, I love this kid. What do you do? You know, but. I would have spent less money in medical school. <laughs> oh, nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I don't think I would have done anything specifically differently. I'm um, very happy with where I'm currently. I would have gone to PA school earlier. <laughs> I, re I, I love my job. I, you know, I like taking care of people and I wish I would have found it sooner. So I think the only thing I really would have done differently is probably tried a little bit harder to match into a U.S. medical school um, and applied maybe more broadly than I had um, to U.S. medical schools. That is only because it, it makes everything down the road easier. So it makes matching into residency easier. And then you match into a better residency, it makes matching into fellowship easier. And so everything is less of a struggle going down the road. With that being said, I got the same education and everything is fine, but it would have been nice to struggle less. Um, no, I, mean, I think I would probably would have done, probably would have kept everything pretty much the same. In undergrad, I would have, I worked a lot. I worked like full-time hours and I wish I would have borrowed a little more money to work less, to be able to devote more time to studies, which would have helped me in the long run. But at 18, it's hard to make that decision. Okay, I would probably be nicer to nurses and be less judgmental. I became a nurse and I would be a nurse again. Seem to hear there. That's my erotic thoughts, but plus also just be happy. So what is something you wish you knew when you were entering med school? Was the time and sacrifice worth it? do you miss out on anything? I would say this kind of goes with med school and with residency and any part of training is um, you can do anything. And that's not like sort of a, oh, you know, set your heart to it. It really, um, it it's kind of daunting uh, when you start out. You're like, oh, I have to learn this whole new language. I got to learn all this stuff. I've got to then learn how to practice and I've got to do this. And really, if, if you do anything enough, you're going to be good at it. And you there are a lot of people in this world that could be very good physicians, just, um, you know, mentally, as far as uh, being able to comprehend everything. And that's not more the difficult part of it, but 
you know, you, you go in and, you know, you, you, oftentimes you'll, you'll have the parade of stars, you know, you know, the head of surgery, the head of internal medicine, all these people that come in, you're like, oh, there's no way I could be like them. And it, it's difficult. And you're like, oh, you, you start out on the wards and you, you learn about patients. You're carrying like two to three patients. You're like, how am I ever going to remember all these details and do it? And really, you can do it like you're not going to be perfect at it right away. There's a reason med school's four years. There's a reason most residencies are three to four years. It takes time to be good at it, but you will become good at it, whatever that is, even if you don't even really like it, which unfortunately does happen where people go into becoming a physician and they realize, okay, I'm going to do this for a living, but it's not my passion. I'm just going to, I mean, I'm that committed at this point. I have to do something that's going to make over six figures just to pay it off. Um, but you will get good at anything. You do it daily basis. As long as you're putting in some effort and you're not just saying, okay, this follows this exact pattern. I'm, I'm, I'm turning my brain off. I'm just going to use um, you know, type one thinking where uh, it's just move on. You're going to be good at it. You, you could do anything in medicine. If you like neurosurgery, interventional radiology, you know, whatever you want to do, you know, you can be good at. Um, as far as missing out, I don't think I really missed out on too much. Uh, I'll be honest. I had a great time in med school. I had a really good group of friends um, that were there and we'd, we'd study hard and we'd hang out. And it, it, the bonds that I made there are, are, are lifelong, life lasting. I think I got really lucky um, with the, the people that I was with. You know, there certainly are people who can feel very alienated and very much like it's everything's a competition. And luckily, all the friends that I had, um, you know, we all wanted to do well, but it was never there there was no rivalry or you know i'm trying to you know out shoot somebody here or um you know be a gunner versus somebody else we didn't have that at all it was more just okay let's get better all together um which which was great and and i don't think i missed out you i i think you you have to prioritize things that you want to prioritize and, and recognize that you can do whatever you want as far as on a daily basis but you won't be able to do everything um, there, there is no, um, you know, I'm the perfect researcher, I'm the, um, perfect everything else. I go and, uh, take three day weekends, um, you know, over in Italy. And at the same time, I'm running this busy lab and it's not, you got to choose what's important to you. And, um, the other thing is that when you have things that are less important to you, you have to let them go and you just have to be okay with saying, okay, this is, this is not going to happen and it's okay. And I'm, I'm enough without that. Um, certainly in my professional life, is to listen. So you have a lot of questions about, you know, how people feel about this, if they want to, you know, end their life, they want to do this, they want to do that. And and you're kind of like, well, you know, how do you feel about that? Well, I want to say it's not how I feel about it. It's to listen to what your patient is saying and how do they feel about it? Because that's your focus, right? So um, I think that that skill is invaluable. And I, I do think that sometimes all of us, but particularly maybe with doctors who are extraordinarily busy, um, they don't use that skill if they have it. You know, they just don't have time for it. Uh, but I think that's a great gift. People have been mentioning listening and specifically but uh, empathy. Um, uh, and one of the questions is about empathy training and med school or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally listening is is also good advice. So I'm glad that. Well, I mean, and that's right. You know, kind of the same thing. So if you don't listen, you're not going to be able to be empathetic. Um, and the thing with em teaching empathy in med school I, I I sort of believe that you either have it or you don't have it. Now you can, if you have it and you have an inclination for it, you can refine it. You can come at it from different ways. But I know plenty of people that don't have it. And that going to med school, you know, taking a course in it, well, they would never do it because, you know, they don't have any interest. The overarching theme of a lot of those questions was basically like various stages of your career, do you regret it? So I think overall the answer to that question is no. 
Um, I don't think I could do anything else and find it as fulfilling. Um, and I, I don't think I would want to do anything else. Especially if we're talking about being in the field of medicine, do I regret becoming a surgeon? The answer is definitely not. Um, I love what I do, even though it feels like physical torture sometimes. Um, I've walked upwards of seven and a half to eight, nine miles inside the hospital on call. You know, you're 24 hours and you're just sprinting in circles trying to take care of everybody that you're getting called for. It's very stressful. But um, at the end of the day, you know, um, I really like it. Um, so it, it's worth the stress. What I would say is that um, if you're going into it for any other reason besides I can't see myself doing anything else, um, then I would consider first doing the thing that you think you might want to do. Um for example, there's a girl in my residency who was a teacher for a little while first. She was a fourth grade teacher. She did that for a little while and she's like, it's not it. I want to go to medical school, right? Um, but she could have also found that she really, really loved that and was really happy and wanted to do that. Um, and I think it's important that you're flexible. So if during medical school, you're finding that you don't like any of the specialties. Um, you kind of don't really want to do it. Um, like you don't want to practice medicine. That's okay. Because there's a lot of options in the field of medicine as an overarching umbrella field that are not practicing medicine as a medical doctor. Where you're not at the bedside, you're not taking care of patients. You can do you know, you could be on the bioethics committees, you can do administrative stuff, you can do like engineering stuff, um, or like medical science stuff. There's a lot of other opportunities to use that like medical degree to do other stuff. So even if during medical school, you're finding that you're not figuring out what specialty will make you happy, and that you feel like you're kind of like meh, um, there's still options. So the important thing is to remain flexible. That's also true for if you think you want to do a specific residency. So I thought I wanted to go into pediatrics. Then I went into medical school and I got really involved in our women's um, healthcare stuff. I went to medical school in Grenada on an island and we did a lot of outreach and I got really passionate about it. Um, and so then I was like, oh, maybe I want to go into like OBGYN and, you know, do women's health care. And like, I really like talking about this stuff. I'm comfortable with saying the correct anatomical terms. They don't make me squirm, you know? Um, so like, I, I, you know, thought I wanted to do that. And then on my first clinical rotation was surgery. <clears throat> and I remember I was coming home every day. And my mom was like, wow, you're really happy. You're like excited to be going to work at five in the morning. That's kind of weird. I was like, it is weird since I'm sometimes leaving at like seven or eight or 9 p.m. Like I'm staying extra late for cases. I'm getting like four hours of sleep and I'm stoked about it. Like <laughs> that's kind of weird. And then everything else was boring. And I was like, yeah, I guess I'm going to do surgery because everything else sucks. And surgery was awesome. Um, and so it's important to just be really flexible because in the span of like three years, I went through three different specialties. Um, so I don't regret it. It is a lot of work. You're going to be really stressed out. You have to figure out your coping mechanisms, whatever they may be. Um, and if at any point you feel like you're not going down the right path or you're forcing yourself down a path remember to be flexible because you can always go somewhere else
which is is true, but anyway, off topic. Your background, the wallpaper, is this, uh, would you like to explain it? Would you like to say something about it? I am at my friend Rachel's and her wallpaper is weird. Uh, I don't know why I'm in jungle right now with monkeys, but this is their guest bedroom. So whenever I come to DC to um, visit them, this is the jungle I stay in. It reminds me of um, my pediatric uh, wallpaper, my oh, like my yeah. his office. So is she in pediatrics yeah. at all or no? No, no, no. But that yeah. is really accurate. It does remind me of a pediatrician's office, a hundred and ten percent. Also, my apartment complex is something really interesting. When you get a dog here, they make you send in a stool sample of your dog's stool, which they test genetically. So if your dog is crapping all over the apartment complex and you're not picking up after it, you can get evicted. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't want to like step in dog crap. That seems like a big invasion. I've never lived somewhere where any DNA test was on the table for any part of the lease agreement. Um, you know, I don't know. It's like doing cola guard or something where they send a box to my door. I got to collect yeah. it. It's just disgusting. But uh, did you think of what you would spend $10 million on? I'd keep it and retire. No, I'm kidding. I wouldn't do that. You know, initially, uh, when I was asked this question like two years ago, it would have been vaccine hesitancy, but now I just don't even care. You know, like that's too that's gonna cost way more than ten million dollars to answer that yeah. question. Americans are are what they are. <laughs> Sorry, you probably hear my kids screaming. I mean, yeah, we'll have to go move locations and go to the office. They're now like right above me. Can you hear them really loud? I can hear them now, but also I'd love to say hi to Katie. I think that'd be right, fun. Hey, Katie. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. This is Margo. That's Did you ever meet William? Dana, William? Hi. Perfect. I mean, the surgeons are going to watch this and be like, stop fucking surgery. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I threw it in there as just like a really light, easy question. And then I realized, all the people I'm asking were like super duper busy during that time. And you're like, I, this is a bad question, but uh, everyone's been answering it very politely so far. You're the first one to be like, no, I was freaking busy. <laughs> you know, because I think that's one of the, I don't know, for me, it's definitely, I don't communicate via text. I communicate in conversation. So, um, mm -hmm. Molly, I was going to go to you next, but it sounds like you got some background noise. You good? Uh, I think he stopped singing. <laughs> okay, I can go to mom if you need if you need a singing break. Oh, but uh, <laughs> so Zeno transplantation, no issue. Yeah, I'll be fine. Yeah, I mean, as long as they got consent from the pig. Eugene's up here now. <laughs> yeah, you kind of hear some uh, water uh, going in the background. Yeah, sure yeah. Sorry, I was washing. Well. There was something. Oh, so this is. Got, I I just wanted to just this may not need to be right, anywhere, just so you but, know this is also being recorded though yeah i know okay. but this is an interesting thing because because you, you, you had you were talking to me we were talking earlier about the um the whole concept of, of physicians and physician and 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 um you know and public trust and things like that like on twitter when people are like oh they're all just trying to keep us sick so they can keep making money off of us i'd be, be cured those kind of people but when you take into account that a lot of times what we're talking about it is people who are, you know, like, you know when you're talking about people who are you know, very elderly, oh, goodness, Iris. Just give me a point so you can figure out. So, like, elderly, you know, you know patients who are, like, very ill um, and, and are undergoing a surgery that, you know, has a low risk of success, you know, or low chance of success, but you're trying in an, in an error will lead, can, can lead to death in those cases, right? So like, so, so I think what the point I'm trying to make is it's the interesting era that we live in with the amount of information that is out there and how easy it is to mis misinterpret that information. Um, it, 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 it does make it really, it's really much more difficult to, uh, I don't know, but, but I think it's an interesting idea that if you want to 
I, so I was uh, uh, I was on call in the hospital. I had a new admission, a pretty sick guy down in the ER, and I was in gastrointestinal distress. I don't know if it was something I ate or what, but I was like cramped and bloated. It was just not great. It's not fun to be in the hospital when you're feeling like that. But I had to go see this guy down in the ER, and he's pretty sick. He's on medicine to keep his blood pressure up. He's probably got to go to the ICU. He's barely conscious. He's got big problems. He's got a bad heart. His heart's not working effectively. So I'm in the room with him by himself. I'm trying to take his history, and my stomach is just grumbling. And I can tell that I need to pass gas, but like, I need to get this guy's history. I got to like do this work. I got to figure all this stuff out. So like, I can't just like go to the bathroom for 10 minutes. Like this guy's sick. It's going to be a really bad look if I like go see the sick guy and then leave and then I'm gone for a half hour and then come back to see the sick guy. But I'm just like cramping up and I'm like contorting my body while I'm talking to him. And then I can't help myself. And I pass gas. I fart like audibly, like very loud in this guy's room. This guy can barely like open his eyes. Or like like answer questions meaningfully, but I farted. I was mortified. I didn't say anything, thinking maybe he didn't hear me. He's barely conscious. And he picked his head up off the bed and he was like, Did you just fart? And I was like, Yeah, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. I'm so embarrassed. And he goes, Come on, man. They're gonna think it was me. He was embarrassed. He was like, the nurses are gonna think I farted. And I was like, Bro, that is the least of your concerns right now. Your heart's barely beating. All right. So let's get back to you. I think that the ER nurse is not gonna be like, I am personally offended by the smell of this fart. Or if they were like, I wouldn't have minded if the patient had farted, but this was Dr. Wagner's fart. I am not going in that room. <laughs> How are you going to look me in the eye and be like Dr. Wagner knowing that I farted? Everybody farts. This is medicine. We're all medical professionals. I'm just going to call a spade a spade. I don't feel bad about it. I would do it again, too. Well, I read the book Everybody Poops, but uh, I didn't know. Was there a sequel, Everybody Farts? Yeah, it's really the prequel, actually. Everybody, everybody farts to the, yes um is it possible to get your cat back and um oh, yeah. introduce your cat yeah let me go get him okay it might not be might not be able to find jack his name is jack <laughs> he only he's a cat it sounds like he does what he wants to do correct are you looking off screen because you see the cat mm -hmm. do you want to do you think you can get him i got him nice jack you're going to say hi to Tom. Jack, say hi to Tom. Hi, Jack. Do you, did you have anything else that you wanted to answer and get off your chest or, or say before I end the recording? No. Was I leaning in? Now I just leaned in for a second. I was like, oh my gosh, my forehead looks massive. Hopefully I wasn't doing that the whole time. But, no, 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 no. Uh, oh, okay, good.